Wow, I ended the music very abruptly, so sorry about that. Uh, I thought the song was closer to over. So, uh, howdy campers, how are we doing today? Uh, it's a fabulous Friday before that day where people shoot a lot of fireworks about our country being racist or something. Uh, not quite sure what's going on there, but that's okay because we're not concerned about that. Because we're at summer camp, you guys. Like, this is the best time of our lives. So, uh, hopefully we have more than just a couple campers today. Uh, because the more campers, the better, obviously. We got crafts, we got spooky stories, we got anything you're gonna need. For real. So, uh, yeah. America. Yeah. It's July, so summer camp time. We got friendship bracelets, you guys. Check these bracelets out I made today. Um, I can make some bracelets for you guys who are my loyal fans, and I will mail them to you. So, uh, it's pretty cool. Also, apparently I'm like a scene kid, uh, camp counselor today. So, that's okay. Um, that's my new thing, apparently, with my new haircut, so it's pretty awesome. Ironwood dresser DIY. I'm pretty sure I already have that one, but that is, like, a really important one. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know what I'm talking about, um, thanks to Martha's abrupt announcement, uh, Animal Crossing is really important in life, and it adds a lot of value. It's just like camping. You're on a desert island. You, you get to meet animal friends and build a tent and then a house and stuff. Um, but they also introduced swimming today for the first time. And so that's pretty awesome. Uh, I did a little bit of swimming today. I collected like eight sea creatures. I talked to Pascal for the first time. It was really great. So I'm super about it. I hope you guys are super about it. Um, the swimming... And Animal Crossing is pretty great because I haven't played for a little while and that's definitely making me want to play more. So it's 7.09 so we'll wait just a couple minutes before we get ready for our book for today. Uh, I'm probably extra entertaining today because I already started drinking earlier. So hopefully that works really well for you guys because it's working okay for me. Um... Yeah, so, okay, so, like, the last two weeks, we kind of talked about creating, like, a Goosebumps fan club, but we didn't really talk about, like, a specific name for it, or we kind of did, but we didn't really come up with anything, so I really want to come up with something so that we can try and make, like, t-shirts or something, and I can send you some sweet swag, and I'll put little alphabet letters on it, but I need to know what alphabet letters to put on because we need to have a name for all of my wonderful friends that join me on the stream every week. So I'm really interested in continuing that communication through the chat and figuring out what we're going to call ourselves. We can't call ourselves Ride the Tiger. <laughs> I feel like it's, it doesn't make sense as like a group name, even though that was like probably the funniest thing that's happened in this entire series so far was when they just kept saying ride the tiger over and over again. Um, I mean, we could be like tiger scouts. Do you guys want to be tiger scouts? I feel like that would be like close to where we were. E were high. I don't know what you just said there. I have no idea what that means. So, um, everybody let me know about tiger scouts. Especially because we're at camp this week. I feel like that's extra cool. Uh, are you guys ready for this book? Because I'm ready for this book. Look, there's like two of this book. Um, everything's backwards on my screen, so I really struggle to try and point at this one that's over here right now. So it says we got eight viewers, so we're going to get going, you guys. Um, we read the back before, but let's read. There's like... So there's a back intro, and then there's like an internal intro. So uh, we'll read the internal intro before we get started with the actual book, just to kind of see what's going to happen. Because I have not read this yet, as you guys know. 
I do not read these books prior to our um, prior to our streaming because I want to be surprised too. I feel like it's more fun that way. So, okay. Welcome to Camp Running Leaf. It's the sports camp of your dreams, but this place is weird. The coaches are slave drivers. The campers act like little robots. And the food? Well, let's just say there's nothing to write home about. The activities sound cool, though. You can camp overnight and look for bones in Zombie Cave. Coach says you'll win a medal or become one of the Walking Dead. Uh, he was just kidding about the dead part, wasn't he? Or you can complete the selection. It's an awesome obstacle course with stuff like water jumps. Only hold on, why is that water squirming? You're in control of this scary adventure. You decide what will happen and how terrifying the scares will be. Start on page one, follow the instructions at the bottom of each page. You guys make the choice, I will read the choice, and you guys will have the summer of your dreams. Take a deep breath, cross your fingers, and turn to page one to give yourself goosebumps. <clears throat> All right, you say to yourself. Ten minutes ago, it looked as if you were facing another boring day at home. All the kids in your neighborhood are away at summer camp. But all but you. Your parents decided to take you on a family vacation instead to your grandparents' farm. Boring. But your mom and dad just got an urgent call to join a dig for dinosaur bones in Mongolia. They're leaving in the morning. We'll be away for a month, your mom says. Sorry, sweetie, but we'll have to send you to Camp Pendleton after all. I guess I'll live, you reply, hiding your grin. Yes, Pendleton is a sports camp. You love sports. You've wanted to go to Camp Pendleton ever since your Uncle Ed told you about it. It's got the latest equipment and the best coaches. You quickly call Uncle Ed with the good news. He promises to take care of all the arrangements. He'll even drive you there. The next morning, Uncle Ed arrives. Your parents are rushing around, getting ready to leave. They kiss you goodbye and remind you to be careful. Don't worry about me, you reply. What could go wrong? Nothing, right? Turn to page two. I'm psyched, you announce when you slide into Uncle Ed's station wagon. You're going to have a great time, Uncle Ed declares. Your uncle usually doesn't talk much about himself. You aren't even sure what he does for a living. But you do know that he likes sports, and that's what you talk about on the way to Camp Pendleton. Only, it's taking forever to get there. It's out in the boondocks. All the roads here look the same. You stop for a snack. Uncle Ed makes a quick phone call, and then he starts the car again. He pulls out onto the road, going in the wrong direction. Uncle Ed, you say? I think you're going the wrong way. Nah, Uncle Ed says. I've got a great sense of direction. You spot an old man in front of a lone house in the woods. Pull over, Uncle Ed, you urge. Let's ask. Sports camp? The old man frowns. There's a camp about a mile away. He gives Uncle Ed instructions to get there. If you pass the gas station, then you'll know you've gone too far. See, I told you I knew where I was going, Uncle Ed says. A minute later, Uncle Ed turns down a dirt road. He pulls up to a military-looking gatehouse. A big sign says, Welcome to Camp Running Leaf. Huh? Where's Camp Pendleton, you cry. Uncle Ed only shrugs. He doesn't seem very upset. A beefy guy with a crew cut, a white shirt, and a whistle around his neck approaches your car. <coughs> Uncle Ed only shrugs. I'm Coach Rex, he says. Are you a new camper? No, I'm looking for Camp Pendleton, you answer. Coach Rex clears his throat. Uh, this was Camp Pendleton. The new owner just took over and changed the name to Running Leap. So everything's okay, right? You say goodbye to Uncle Ed. He shakes hands with Coach Rex. Work this youngster hard, he orders. Oh, I'm a slave driver, Coach Rex answers with a chuckle. Coach Rex and Uncle Ed laugh like two old friends. Coach Rex leads you to a cabin. He points out an empty bunk and drops your stuff off on it. 
Think you're a hotshot athlete, he shouts. Surprised, you said her. No, um, I just like sports. Coach Rex barks. We don't put up with wimps here. He gives you a once-over. You don't look very strong. You thought you were in pretty decent shape, but let's arm wrestle, Coach Rex demands. What's his problem? He seemed so friendly a minute ago. You sit at opposite sides of a table. Coach Rex pins your arm in an instant. He looks disappointed. Kid, you don't have what it takes, he announces. But you will. And soon. It sounds more like a threat than a promise. Suddenly, Coach Rex brightens. The first thing for you to do is choose one of two events to take part in. One event is an overnight hike and a fossil hunt in the woods around the camp. You'll love camping out. Sounds cool. The other event is called Selection. It's a series of athletic events. The winner gets a special prize. So which one are you guys going to choose? And then here's the part in the stream where I forget to preload the poll, just like every week. And it's going to take a second before we actually get to vote. So give it a little time. And it's almost ready. We're getting there. Um, if you guys want to share like your favorite camp memories in our chat, that would be amazing. And I would love it so much. Which one is for zombies? Um, I think maybe the hike will end up zombies. But I'm not really sure. Sorry. Sorry, Ollie and Rochelle. It's not ready yet. You're going to have to vote again. Okay. Is it ready? No, it's not ready. Now it's ready. Okay. Vote option one to pick the hike or vote option two to pick the selection. actually go you guys I'm so sorry I don't even know what it's thinking we're gonna try again okay now it really will work um, everyone voted for one though so I feel like maybe we don't even need to run it sorry work is having problems okay um, everybody before the poll worked chose one so we're just gonna go with one here okay first tab we're gonna go on the hike on page 78 you hold your stomach groaning what that was the wrong page ignore that I'll try the hike you decide okay Meet Coach Crump at the equipment shed, Coach Rex orders. He points out the shed to you. Get going, camper. Four other kids are already waiting in the equipment shed when you get there. A dark-haired girl with braces smiles at you. I'm Tracy, she says. I'm going on the hike, too. The other kids introduce themselves as Samantha, Al, and Ted. Samantha, a tall, strong-looking girl, beckons all four of you closer. I've heard some strange things about this hike. She whispers. They say some kids don't make it back from it. Then why are you going, Al says. I want to win the outdoors medal, Samantha replies calmly. You smile to yourself. Camps always have silly, scary stories. You know Samantha's only trying to psych you out for the competition. But you're a good hiker, and you plan to win the medal yourself. Here comes another hiker, Ted exclaims. 
You glance up and see someone running towards the shed. Oh no, you groan. What's wrong on page 36? You know the person running towards the shack. Her name is Kim. She goes to your school back home. You've disliked her since you did a geography project together. Kim complained the whole time. Even worse, you had to do all the work. I don't believe this, she exclaims when she catches sight of you. Of all the camps in the world, in the whole country, <laughs> I end up at the same one as you. Great. She's already complaining, you think. A pale, heavy-set man in a white shirt comes puffing up. I'm Coach Crump, he says. Okay, listen up, campers. The point of the hike is to earn your outdoors medal. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a shiny disc. This is the medal, he says. He holds it up. It gleams in the sunshine as if it's made of gold. A small figure is carved into it. You can't quite make out what it is. Cool, you murmur. You reach for the medal to examine it more closely. Coach Crump snatches it away. Hands off, he thunders. Go on to page 52. I just wanted to see the medal, you gasp, shocked. Not till you've completed the hike, Coach Crump bellows. He leans over. Understand? He says right in your face. This guy is weird, you think. You wonder if you made the wrong choice. To earn your medals, you must be able to read a map and get around in the wilderness, Coach Crump goes on. He holds up a map and points to a mountain. You must find Zombie Cave, here on Zombie Mountain, and remove a bone from it as proof that you were there. Zombie Mountain? Excellent. You love spooky stuff. A bone, Kim explains. Ew. The cave is full of bones, Coach Crump declares. Human bones, he adds with a smile. Now he passes out maps, one to each kid. After you leave Zombie Cave, he continues, we'll all meet at the campsite on Zombie Mountain. Cool, you think. First, a spooky fossil hunt, and then a camp out? This is going to be great. One more thing, Coach Crump adds. He glares from camper to camper. Watch out for zombies. What? Turn to page 132. You crack up. There's no such thing as zombies, you snort. Are you sure? Coach Crump narrows his eyes at you. Why do you think they call it Zombie Mountain? You know he's just fooling, but he sounds awfully serious. What do zombies look like? Kim asks. They're the walking dead, Coach Crump replies. They crave living flesh, and a zombie's bite will turn you into a zombie. You and Al snicker. It's not funny, Coach Crump says solemnly. Every year we lose a few campers to the zombies. Okay, but the coach is just trying to make the hike sound more fun. But isn't he going a little overboard? Ted pipes up. I've heard stories about a strange guy who lives on Zombie Mountain. They call him the Cemetery Man. Crump scowls. He doesn't exist, he snaps. Okay, people, the gear is in the shed. Take what you need and get started. You take a sleeping bag, pack, food, and a flashlight. Coach Crump hands you a map and a box labeled Survival Kit. You're turning to go when the coach stops you. Wait, he exclaims. I forgot to tell you the most important thing of all. No matter what, you must reach the campsite by midnight. Go on to page 50. What happens if we're late, you ask? Are the zombies going to get us? Al adds, grinning. They might, Coach Al glares at Al. Or they could just as easily get you earlier. But if you're late, you're disqualified. No outdoor medals for you. We won't be late, you all chorus. You'll be safer hiking in pairs, Crump calls. As soon as you've chosen partners, start the hike. See you at the campsite. You see that Samantha has already paired up with Al. Ted and Tracy are starting up the trail together. That leaves you with... Kim? No way, you think. She's lazy. She's a complainer. Besides, you're a good hiker. You don't need a partner. On the other hand, Coach Crump told you to pair up. What will you do? If you decide to pair up with Kim, choose option one. If you want to hike alone, choose option two.
27 seconds left to vote, you guys. Choose option one to pair up with Kim or choose option two to hike alone. Okay, so clearly you guys don't want to hike with Kim, so we're going alone. Later, you tell Kim, I'm hiking by myself. You strap your sleeping bag to your backpack, stick your water bottle in your pocket, and start off down the trail. The other kids are already ahead of you, but you don't mind. It's a great day for a walk in the woods. Up ahead, Zombie Mountain is in view. The top is sharp and craggly, but it doesn't look too steep. As you tramp through the woods, the trail twists and turns. You come to a fork in the road. You choose the branch that turns towards the mountain. After an hour, you reach another fork. You listen for other hikers. All you hear are birds singing. Which way should you go? You reach into your pack for your map. You study it, searching for the trail you're on. Hey, what's going on? This map is totally confusing. There are three trails on it, and none of them looks like the one you're on. You're lost. To try and find your way, turn to page 109. You stare at the map again. This is crazy, you tell yourself. You turn the map around. It's no better upside down. Maybe the problem is you. You're not that good with maps. You think back to your geography project with Kim. She was a pain, but she was good at reading maps. Maybe you should have teamed up with her after all. Maybe it's not too late. If you can find Kim, the two of you might be able to figure out how to find Zombie Cave. The only problem is, where's Kim? She's probably on the main trail, you guess. But which way is the main trail? You're going to need a map of your own and some good luck to bring back to the main trail. Here's what you do. Oh, gosh, this is difficult, you guys. Okay. So it says, uh, find a map of the United States. Locate the Mississippi River on the map. And then, with your eyes closed, circle your finger around and let it land on the map. If your finger lands west of the Mississippi, that's left, turn left. If your finger lands east of the Mississippi, that's right, and turn right. Um, so I don't know... If anyone has a map, I guess you guys can just decide if we want to go west of the Mississippi, choose option one. If we want to go right of the Mississippi, choose option two. So this book was uh, copyright 1997. Uh, in 1997, I'm pretty sure I didn't actually have a map of the United States, like, at my house or in my room. I, I don't know. Okay, if you got west, then you need to vote number one. If you got east, vote number two. is up. Everybody voted number two. So apparently we're going east of the Mississippi River uh, on page 121. Well, everybody except for Ollie. You decide to take the right hand fork. You take a gulp of water and then start towards the right. The trees are thick on this trail. The farther you go, the harder it is to move. Branches and twigs scrape across your face and arms. You stop to catch your breath. And you hear something behind you. Something large. Thump, thump, thump goes its heavy steps. Maybe it's only my imagination, you think, hopefully. But the thumping noise gets closer, and now you hear something else. Breathing. Hoarse, raspy breathing. You break into a run. 
scrambling through the trees. You stumble blindly, trying to escape from whatever's behind you. And then something grabs you around the neck. Go on to page 90. Gotcha, cries a familiar voice. Kim, you scream. You whirl around angrily. Kim is standing behind you with a stupid grin on her face. What did you think? I was a zombie? She laughs. Funny, you grumble. Don't you know there's no such thing as zombies, Kim adds. I know that, you snap. I knew it was you. I was looking for you. My map is wrong. I wanted to compare it with yours. You could never follow a map, Kim de declares. So I guess you have to follow me. She giggles. That's it. If you're too scared to hike with me. You swallow an angry comment. Payback will come later. Meanwhile, you want that outdoors medal. And you've already wasted a couple of hours. It looks like you have no choice. Turn to page 118. You sigh. All right, let's team up. You say to Kim. You watch while she studies her map. You hate to admit it, but it's true. Kim is a much better map reader than you. Zombie Cave is on the other side of Zombie Mountain, she remarks, pointing to a squiggle on the map. Also, the caps campsite is on the same side of the mountain as the cave, she continues. They look close to each other. So let's get started, you say impatiently. Wait, Kim cautions. According to the map, there are two ways to get to the cave. We could take the main trail up over the mountain, but it's very steep. What's the other way, you ask? The other way is to follow the river around the mountain, she explains. But it's much longer. Also, she squints at the paper. There's some strange markings I can't figure out. You glance at her map. X's line the riverbank. You decide. Which route seems easiest, Kim asks you. You study the map. Both routes look tough to you. Which one do you want to take? If you want to climb the mountain and take the shorter path, then you'll choose option one. If you want to follow the river and take the longer unknown path, choose option two. Fifteen seconds left to vote, you guys. If you climb the mountain and take the shorter path, choose option one. If you follow the river and take the unknown X path, choose option two. Okay, so we decided to take option one. We're gonna climb the mountain. It might be hard, but it'll be faster. Maybe. Page 113. You and Kim toil up the mountain. It takes all afternoon, but the most tiring part of the hike isn't the climbing. It's listening to Kim complain. At last, you spot what you came for. In the face of a cliff, it's a dark, forbidding hole. Zombie cave! A trail leads down to it from where you are. You and Kim hike down the steep trail. About halfway down, you hear a strange noise. A combination cough and growl. What's that? Kim asks nervously. Zombies, you reply in a spooky voice. Kim shrieks. Just kidding, you tell her, grinning. As you continue down, you hear the sound again. Hmm, it seems to be following you. Ignore it, you tell Kim. You're almost at the cave mouth. You run ahead of Kim and enter the cave alone. But when you see what's waiting inside, you freeze. Go on to page 18.
Kim comes up behind you. What's wrong? She asks. Uh, a zombie, you stammer. Oh, please, Kim snaps. I mean, do I look that stupid? You'd like to answer that question, but you're speechless because the creature in the cave is the nastiest thing you've ever seen. Gashes cover its colorless face. Its eyes are dead. It smells dead. No, you cry. It really is a zombie. The thing takes several steps towards you. It moans. Eee! Kim screams. Sorry, we, uh, we took a wrong turn, you tell the undread monster. You begin backing out the way you came. The zombie staggers towards you. Run, you order to Kim. The zombie lumbers after you. It doesn't run fast, but it doesn't tire either. How can you escape, you wonder frantically. And then you have an idea. Climb up the cliff, you shout at Kim. Are you crazy, she cries. It's a cliff. Would you rather get caught by a zombie, you ask? Enough said. The two of you start climbing up the cliff. Scramble up to page 80. You pull yourself frantically up. Your arms ache. You glance down. The zombie is trying to climb the cliff too, but it's clumsy. Its rotting fingers can't grasp the rocks. Finally, it seems to give up. You hang there, halfway up the cliff, and watch as it vanishes into the trees. Whew, I think it's gone, you tell Kim. Come on, let's head back down the cliff. You've almost reached the bottom when you hear a growl. Crouched in your path is a mountain lion. The big cat's yellow eyes gaze hungrily at you. Uh-oh, head back up, you whisper. But just as you inch up the cliff, a huge boulder bounds down the slope, just missing you. The zombie, Kim cries. It must have climbed up the trail. It's up at the top of the cliff. You duck as another boulder hurtles past your ear. Let's get out of here, Kim cries. Great idea, you think. But where to? If you head down, the mountain lion will attack. And if you climb up, you'll have to face the zombie. If you guys want to head down towards a mountain lion, you'll choose option one. If you want to head up towards a zombie, choose option two. We still have 20 seconds left to vote. If you want to head down the mountain towards the mountain lion, choose option one. If you want to head up towards a zombie, then choose option two. decided to go with option two. We're going to head up towards the zombie on page 54. A hungry mountain lion can move a lot faster than a hungry zombie, you reason. Better take your chances with the corpse. Up, you order Kim. You scramble back up the cliff. Rocks and pebbles rain down around you. Urgh, the zombie bellows from above. You peer up. It hefts another huge boulder. Oh no, how can it miss when you're this close? Then the zombie slips. Urgh, it cries as it tumbles down through the air. Down, down, down. It lands with a sickening thud far below. Yuck. Wow, Kim, you comment as you reach the top of the cliff. That zombie really fell for you. Oh, first great pun of the day. Ha ha, Kim huffs. Time to check out the cave. 
You hike down the trail and stand nervously at the entrance. A faint light glows from the inside. Let's take a deep breath. Let's do it, you say to Kim. Let's enter Zombie Cave. We'll go on. Enter the cave at page 126. Carefully, you and Kim poke your heads into Zombie Cave. Hello, you call, hoping no one will answer. Phew, no one does. The cave is empty. You peer down at the floor. No footprints in the loose soil. You must be the first hikers to reach the cave. Come on, Kim says impatiently. Let's find the bones. Where is the light coming from, you wonder? And then you notice faint green streaks of glowing minerals in the cave walls. A quick search doesn't turn up any bones. First, you feel disappointed. And then you feel something on your leg. It tickles. Absently, you reach down and scratch your thigh. Ugh! A giant spider crawls onto your hand. With a yell, you flick the spider away. It flies off your hand and lands on a glittering object, half buried in the cave floor. A gold ring! Maybe we should dig here, you suggest eagerly. We might find buried treasure. Or you might find buried terror. See what's there on page 71. You dig with your bare hands in the soft earth. Kim doesn't help. I don't want to break a nail, she sniffs. After digging down a few inches, you feel something hard. You paw feverishly at the dirt. Is it gold? Jewels? Kim bends over for a look. It's a skeleton, she gasps. Human! You feel a chill. You thought Coach Crump was kidding when he said there was a cave full of human bones. But it seems he was serious dead serious. Swallowing your fear, you keep digging. Ten minutes later, you've uncovered the entire skeleton. Yuck, I'm not touching that thing, Kim declares. You're not eager to touch it either, but you've got to get a bone if you're going to win the outdoor medal. And after all you've been through, you want that medal. One of the ribs is cracked, Kim points out. Break it off and take it. You think it might be easier to lift off the skull. But on the other hand, the skull is bulky. It won't fit in your pack. If you want to take the skull with us, you'll choose option one. If you want to go for the rib, choose option two. There's still 15 seconds left to vote. Vote one to take the skull. Vote two for to go for the rib. Okay, so we decided to go for the skull, you guys. We're turning to page 17. Why for go for a boring old rib when you could impress all the other hikers with a skull? You place your hands around the skeleton's head. A shiver runs along your spine. You're holding a human skull in your hands. Slowly, gently, you begin to pull. At first, nothing happens. And then suddenly, the skull pops off the neck bones and begins to vibrate in your hands. What's happening, Kim cries. I don't know, you exclaim. A red glow appears in the skull's bony eye sockets, and then its jaw moves, and it begins to speak. Many thanks, it booms. You nearly drop the skull. Are, are you alive, you gasp? I was once, the skull replies. An evil spell made me into what I am now. Who cast the spell, you ask, wide-eyed? The person I replaced 
He left me here to guard the cave. My freedom comes only when someone else takes my place. Takes his place? What do you mean, you demand? Go on to page 66, if you can handle it. Watch, the skull commands. As you stare in horror, the headless skeleton's fingers begin to twitch. Its arms move. The pile of bones stands up. In the space between the ribs begins to fill with organs. First, a red, bloody, beating heart appears. Then, a slimy brown liver and a red stomach. Wet, gray lungs inflate with air. Muscles grow over the skeleton's bones. Then, skin. The skeleton is a living human being again. It steps towards you, holding out its hand. Help! Kim screams, running from the cave. You try to follow, but your feet, they seem to be stuck to the floor. No, you plead, no! Too late. As the former skeleton touches you, your skin crumbles and peels off. Your organs shrivel and fall out. You're turning into a living skeleton. The former skeleton snatches its head from your hands, and then it shoves you into the hole you dug. Your bones fall, clattering. Guard the cave well, the skeleton orders. And remember, if you want to get out of here, just use your head. The end. Oh, you guys! Okay, you said the woodsman and the lantern with the beast, and I recognize the over the hedge wall reference, but I don't get how that is like replacing the skeleton. You guys, that one was so good. That was like the grossest, creepiest ending I think we've had in the entire series so far. So this one's gonna go as like my favorite in in so far. So uh, who's gonna like keep track of all the endings for me today, you guys? Is anyone doing that? Do I need to do that? I feel like it's a lot. So, um, cause I have to put the book down and type and say we had one ending. Whoa. And I have caps locks on, which is in Greek. One endings. One endings happened, you guys. One. Um, that was cool. That was so cool. Okay. Let's go back. What can we do different? Let's not die, you guys. We did not as good of a job today as we have done the last few weeks, so... Okay, we decided to take the skull. That was the that was the breaking point. So let's uh, go for the rib instead. We're gonna go to page thirty-two. You reach down and break off the skeleton's cracked rib. A moment later, the rest of the bones crumble to dust. We've got the bone, Kim crows. Yeah, you mutter. You wish you could feel excited, but you're too creeped out. You just want to get out of here. You glance at your watch. 11 p.m. One hour to find the campsite. You and Kim hurry out of the cave. Kim examines her map by flashlight. This way, she calls, heading downhill. She seems confident about where she's going, so you follow her. The moon is up, but it's still very dark in the trees. After a few moments, you come to a place where the trees are thinner the ground seems strangely rocky. Come on, Kim orders, beckoning impatiently. You're halfway across the rocky field when you stumble over something. You shine your flashlight down to see what it was. Whoa, it's not a rock. It's a gravestone. You're in a graveyard. Turn to page 137. Oh, I don't like graveyards, Kim whines. Why did we have to come this way? Don't ask me. You're the one with a map, you retort, and then you notice something odd. A glass beaker, the kind they use in a science lab, is lying on top of a gravestone. You step closer, squinting at the white label on the beaker. Property of the cemetery man, you read aloud. The cemetery man? Wasn't that the guy Ted asked about? The one Coach Crump said didn't exist? And then you hear a noise. Scrape, scrape, scrape. The sound is coming from a grave. The one with the beaker on it. You aim your flashlight at the grave. No, this cannot be real. 
A hand is pushing its way up through the ground. A moment later, a hideous head thrusts out into the air. The same thing is happening at the other graves. The dead are rising. Flee to page 47. A freshly risen zombie staggers towards you. Foo, it grows. Foo! Finally, you get what it's saying. Food, as in you. You're in total terror meltdown. A zombie grabs you. You knock its hand away. Another has Kim down. It's about to bite her. You tackle the monster and pull it off of her. Your finger sinks deep into the rotten flesh of its arm. Ugh! Run, you scream! You and Kim sprint out of the graveyard. The zombie's heavy footsteps thud behind you. Then, Kim trips over a tree root. She hits the ground hard. No, she shrieks. Help me! I hurt my ankle! Help me! The zombie is only a few feet away. You know that if you were hurt, Kim would leave you hanging. So should you stick your neck out for her? If you want to help Kim, choose option one. If you want to keep on running and leave her behind, you guys will choose option two. And it's going to take a second for the pole to load. Just wait. It's not ready. Because I'm sorry, because my computer is very slow. Maybe someday I will update, upgrade my computer and it'll be faster. Okay, now vote one if you want to help Kim or vote two if you want to keep on running. And I will be right back. I'm back. Sorry for the wait, you guys. I had to pee so bad. It was an emergency. Okay, so option one was the most voted on. We are going to go ahead and help Kim, I guess. I'm surprised you guys voted on that, honestly. Um, page 102. You can't let Kim face the flesh-eating zombie alone. You turn back and grab her hands. Come on, you cry, pulling her up. We'll lose the zombies in the woods. Kim leans on you. The two of you stumble into the trees. You hear the zombie crashing through the trees. Foo, it mutters. Ugh. Quickly, you switch directions, and then the woods are silent. 
Where did the zombie go? Did you lose it? Or is it laying some kind of trap for you? You sniff the air. Is it your imagination? Or can you catch a faint whiff of rotting flesh? Hurry, you urge Kim. You drag her along. The rotten smell grows stronger. And then you crash right into a tall, dark form. Turn to page 48. A zombie! Kim shrieks. What are you talking about? A familiar voice cries. It's Coach Crump. You practically faint with relief. Where have you been? The coach demands. It's almost midnight. You start to tell him about the zombies, but the coach waves you off. Camp's just over this ridge, he tells you. Didn't you see the sign? He points to the white sign that says, Camp Out. You follow him to the campsite. The other kids are already in their sleeping bags, snoring. Isn't there any food? I'm starving, Kim complains. You missed the cookout, Coach replies. He didn't seem to care that you were both hungry. It's time to sleep. How about our medals, you ask? We're the only ones that got a bone from Zombie Cave. We'll talk about it tomorrow, Coach Crump swaps. Now turn in. What a grouch. You crawl into your sleeping bag. You're just dozing off when a noise awakens you. You glance across the campfire and feel your heart stop in fear. Go to page 35. Someone is bending over the sleeping Tracy, aiming a gun at her. You're about to shout a warning, and then you see something that makes you laugh. The gun squirts liquid on her. It's only a water gun. But Tracy sits bolt upright, screaming, and then her eyes film over. Her face seems to shrivel. She moans softly. Ugh. You've heard that moan before. Tracy has turned into a zombie. Something in that water gun is transforming the living into the living dead. The person with the water gun creeps over to Ted's sleeping bag. He squirts the liquid in Ted's face. Ted wakes up with a moan. He rises, hands outstretched. This is awful. All your fellow hikers are becoming zombies. You'd better wake Coach Crump. Maybe he'll know what to do. Quietly, you unzip your sleeping bag. You crawl around the campfire to where Coach is sleeping. But his sleeping bag is empty. Quick, turn to page 25. Coach Crump is gone. You glance back at the person with the water gun. He's now bent over Kim. The embers of the campfire give off just enough light for you to see his face. It's Coach Crump. Coach Crump is the one making your friends into zombies. And now he's moving towards your sleeping bag. You've got to get out of this nightmare. You scuttle towards the woods, but a voice calls out. <sighs> it's Kim. Only Kim is now a zombie. She stands by the fire. Her eyes are lifeless. Flies buzz around her putrid flesh. She points straight at you. Fooooooo. Time to boogie. You zip through the trees. You zag through the bushes. In the distance, you hear Coach Crump shouting, Head for Camp Running Leaf. We'll get the rest of them there. You'd like to warn the campers, except there's no way you can find your way back to camp unless you follow the zombies. It seems risky. Maybe you should just run away. If you guys want to try and follow the zombies back to camp, we'll choose option one. If you want to run as far away from the zombies as possible, you'll choose option two.
Okay, so we decided that option one was our favorite option here. We are gonna go ahead and try and follow the zombies back to camp on page 135. You circle around until you're behind the zombies. Then, from a safe distance, you follow the hideous band. It's easy to keep trap of, track of them in the dark. They smell like a garbage dump. With luck, you'll be able to warn the other campers in time. The zombies shuffle through the dark woods. Suddenly, Coach Crump calls a halt. I hear something, he rasps. Maybe it's that kid who got away. Holding your breath, you duck behind a rock. A mosquito bites you. Swatting at it, you slap your arm. Oops, did somebody hear that? Urgh, someone to your right behind you. Uh-oh, you run as fast as you can for about three feet, and then you trip. When you look up, you're surrounded by zombies. Their undead faces stare hungrily at you, as in your junk food. Congratulations, Coach Crump tells you. You've almost earned your medal. Medal? Move on to page 133. What do you mean, you ask in a shaking voice. The outdoors medal, Camp Crump shouts. Coach Crump shouts. All the others got theirs. Maybe I forgot to mention the rules before, he adds. See, the only way to earn a medal is to become a zombie. No, you howl. You try to crawl away, but it's no use. The zombie kids grab you. Kim bites your arm. Al tears at your legs. Seconds later... Your heart stops. Your breathing stops. Your brain stops. Your entire body turns cold. Coach Crump places a medal around your neck. In camp, it glittered like gold. But actually, the medal is made of cheap plastic. There's a picture of a zombie etched in the center. Around the edge of the pendant are the words, Kiss me, I'm a zombie. The end. <laughs> Two endings, you guys. Um, that was like pretty legit, actually. Uh, I'm okay with that medal. That was pretty fun. Um, especially because it said "kiss me, I'm a zombie," so that was I'm I'm down for that. So, uh, my camping canteen today. Um, this is actually like a miniature bottle of Everclear and like a shot of UV blue and some of this sparkling energy drink and uh, some other energy flavor Mio stuff. I don't know. There's a lot of stuff in here. It was like, literally I just poured like everything that was left in the cupboards into a drink. And then, um, then I've also got these for later on because these are great. So yeah, a plastic metal's pretty lame, right? Like I thought we were going for the real thing, but it makes sense why he wouldn't let us see it before. Cause it said, kiss me, I'm a zombie. But real, real talk though, if we saw the, the metal that said, kiss me, I'm a zombie, would we have still wanted it then? Because I feel like I would still want it because it's still a cool metal. So, I don't know, man. Instead of following the zombies to camp, we're going to try and just run as far away as we can from the zombies and see what happens there. So, that's page 56. Keep running, you say to yourself. Sooner or later, you're bound to find camp or a road, or a town, or something else besides zombies. You crash through the dark woods. All you care about is escaping. Finally, you spot something white ahead. A sign. It reads, Camp Out. Oh no, you're back at the camp out site. You ran in big circles. You stumble to a halt, panting. Snap. A branch breaks. And then you feel breathing on your neck. 
someone or something is right behind you. It's too late to hide. Slowly, you turn around. Face it on page 87. You can't believe who's standing behind you. Uncle Ed, you cry. At last, Uncle Ed says. He's carrying a flashlight. By its glow, you can see that he looks tired and worried. I've been searching for you for hours. Am I glad to see you, you exclaim. The whole incredible story pours out of you about the zombies and Coach Crump. I'm sorry, Uncle Ed says when you're finished talking. I never should have brought you on this mission. Mission? You stare at your uncle in confusion. Uncle Ed glances around to make sure no one's listening. You see, I'm with the X Factors, he whispers. It's a secret security organization. We investigate unnatural events. On the way to Camp Pendleton, I made a phone call, remember? You nod, dazed. The X Factors? That was when I got the assignment to investigate Camp Running Leaf. There were rumors the cemetery man was there. The cemetery man, you exclaim? But Coach Crump said there's no such person as the cemetery man. Uncle Ed shakes his head. He was lying, he tells you. Coach Crump is the cemetery man. Learn the whole horrible truth on page 49. Coach Crump is the cemetery man, you gasp. What does it all mean? Uncle Ed lays his hand on your shoulder. Listen carefully. We don't have much time, he warns. You see, the cemetery man is a chemist. He, well, to put it simply, he developed a chemical that will bring the dead back to life. The thing is, his formula has a horrible side effect. One drop on the skin will turn living humans temporarily into zombies. You remember Coach Crump's water gun and the beaker in the cemetery. They must have held that zombie-making chemical. You stare at Uncle Ed in horror. But why, you blurt? Why is he making all these zombies? He's creating an army, Uncle Ed explains. The zombies are completely under his control. We think he plans to take over the world. He sounds completely insane, you whisper. He is, Uncle Ed agrees. And it's my job to stop him. His, he gazes solemnly at you. But I need your help. Flip to page 123. I'm in, you repeat it instantly. But how can we stop the cemetery man? The first thing is, we've got to get the zombie making chemical from him, Uncle Ed replies. As I mentioned, the side effect on humans is temporary. If they don't get a fresh dose of the chemical every day for a month, the effect will wear off. It'll wear off? What a relief. That means that there's hope for the other hikers. Even Kim. Uncle Ed continues. Here's the plan. One of us will pretend to be a zombie. The pretend zombie will distract Crump, and the other will take the water gun from him. Uh, okay, you say doubtfully. To tell the truth, the plan sounds kind of lame to you. But you don't have any better ideas. The next question is, who gets to play the zombie? If you want to act like a zombie, you'll choose option one. If you want to go for the water gun, you'll choose option two. The music should start over, but it's not doing it. We need more votes. There's four votes and it's a tie. 13 seconds left. Vote one to act like a zombie. Vote two to go for the water gun. 
someone do it? No one did it. Anyone break the tie? Will someone break the tie? Okay, you did it wrong, but I'll count your vote anyway. Everclear minus my face. What? You went to get food, you guys. Okay, we're gonna act like a zombie and go to page 114. I'll be the zombie, you volunteer. Uncle Ed nods. I'm counting on you, he tells you. You and Uncle Ed follow the zombie's trail through the dark woods. It's almost dawn before you catch up with the hideous creatures. They're on a ridge overlooking Camp Running Leaf. You peer out from behind a tree trunk. The zombie kids are sitting around a small campfire. If their eyes weren't open, you'd swear they were all dead. They are dead, you remind yourself. Coach Crump is pacing back and forth. He drones. First, we'll take over Camp Running Leaf. Next, we'll conquer... It sounds like he's addressing the troops, you think with disgust. Uncle Ed taps you on the shoulder. Go, he mouths. You swallow hard. Here goes nothing, you say to yourself. You step into the flickering light of the campfire. Step over to page 12. I can't see myself right now. And you can't really see me because I have huge aviator sunglasses on. So you can't say my face was weird. It wasn't that weird. It's still dark, so the zombies can't see you clearly. You step out from behind a tree. You moan in your best zombie imitation. So the last hiker is now one of us, Crump gloats. Foo, you moan. You wonder for a moment if there's an Oscar for the best imitation of an undead friend. If there were, you wouldn't win it. <laughs> Coach Crump peers suspiciously at you. You look a little too healthy, he says. To be on the safe side, I'd better spray you again. Spray you? Your eyes go wide with horror. Coach Crump raises his water gun. One drop, and you're dead. Worse than dead. But Uncle Ed darts from behind the tree and grabs the gun. It's all over, cemetery man, Uncle Ed calls. You'll never turn another kid into a zombie. No! Coach Crump shrieks. The two men struggle for the water gun. You watch helplessly as they sway back and forth. Is Uncle Ed winning? Suddenly, liquid jets out from the water gun and hits. Hits who? Find out on page 34. Uncle Ed turns around. His eyes are bulging. Coach Crump also turns around. His eyes are dead. Coach Crump has become a zombie. He moans. Foo. And he heads straight for you. Get out of the way, Uncle Ed shouts to you. He holds up the water gun. I'm the master now, Crump. Do my bidding. Crump turns to stare at Uncle Ed, drooling. You hold your breath. Your heart pounds. Can Uncle Ed really control the zombies? Go to page 31. Coach Crump wheels around and stands obediently before Uncle Ed. The zombie kids follow. You let out your breath. Yes, it worked! The next day, Uncle Ed drives you to Camp Pendleton. The real Camp Pendleton. Maybe this time I'll win a medal, you say as you climb out of the car. Maybe, kid. Oh, before I forget, I have something for you. Uncle Ed hands you a slip of pale green paper. What's this, you ask, mystified. It's a check, Uncle Ed replies. Didn't I tell you? There's a reward for capturing the cemetery man. You peer down at the check. Your eyes bulge. You've never seen so many zeros. As it turns out, you don't win any medals at Camp Pendleton, but you don't care because now you can buy 
all the medals you want. The end. Oh, three endings, you guys. I feel like we're definitely on more of a fail path this week, and we're getting, um, uh, we're getting more endings more fast. Oh, medals. Yeah, that was a good emoji. That was a good emoji. Thanks. We got money. I think we did. We get money with a lot of zeros, so I don't know how much money, but it's a lot of money. Okay. So I guess we're going back to where we had the choice to act like a zombie or go for the water gun. And we chose to act like a zombie, so we're going to swap and we're going to try and steal the water gun on page 45. You be the zombie, you tell Uncle Ed. After all, you're the secret agent. You and Uncle Ed track the cemetery man and his army to a clearing near Camp Running Leaf. Hide behind this tree until I give you the signal, Uncle Ed whispers. He lurches into the middle of the clearing, moaning. You peek around the tree. Isn't Uncle Ed getting a little too close to the zombie campers? Before you can warn him, Samantha darts over and bites him on the leg. Foo! she moans. Uncle Ed shudders. His eyes instantly glaze over. His skin turns ashy and starts to curl away from his bones. Guess what? He's not pretending to be a zombie any longer. Uncle Ed spins and points to your hiding place. Foo! He moans. The zombie is stalked towards you. Horrified, you turn and run. But before you get very far, you feel something wet hit the back of your neck. Oh no. Are you brave enough to turn around on page 130? Let's eat the rich, you guys. Eat the rich. You turn around. Coach Crump is standing there, water gun in hand. Okay, so you're a zombie. As it turns out, though, being a zombie is not the worst thing in the world. True, within a month, most of your skin rots away, your teeth and hair fall out, you lose all your toes. But nobody makes any cracks about it. That's because, thanks to the cemetery man and his army, everyone else in the world has also been turned into a zombie. And all you zombies live, uh, that is, don't live, happily ever after. The end. Oh. Did I lose count already? Four endings. That's okay. The whole world's a zombie. I saw literally on a billboard today when I was driving down the highway, there was a billboard that said, what band thinks that the world is a vampire? And I was like, why are they giving us rock trivia? But okay. It's Radiohead, by the way. Obvi. Okay, we're going back to the point where... Um, a zombie was chasing us and we had the choice to help Kim out or to just leave her for the zombies and run anyway. And last time we chose to help Kim because she knows how to read maps and stuff and we do not. But this time we're just going to keep running on page 28 and see what happens. Later, Kim, you call with a burst of speed. You dash down the trail. You look fearfully over your shoulder. The zombie has stopped chasing you. It's bending over Kim. Poor Kim. Now she's really got something to complain about. But you've got your own problems. The main one being, it's five minutes to midnight and no campsite is in sight. Four minutes. You keep running. 
Still no sign of camp. Three minutes. You can barely see the trail. You aim your flashlight down the path, but the batteries go dead. It's midnight. No way you're going to get that medal now. Besides which, you're alone in a forest full of zombies. You're lost. The only thing you can do is lie down your sleeping bag and wait for the morning to come. Camp for the night on page 131. You unroll your sleeping bag. This is fine, you tell yourself. I'll just find the campsite in the morning. If you're still alive in the morning. You eat a candy bar, and then you snuggle into your sleeping bag. You'll have to stay awake all night. You don't dare fall asleep. If you do, zombies could sneak up on you. You'll lie in the sleeping bag, staring at the moon. But gradually, your eyes flutter closed. When you open them again, everything is pitch dark. You try to sit up, but something is wrapped around you. You can't see or hear. You scream like a maniac. You Then you realize. You zipped yourself into your sleeping bag, dummy. When you finally struggle out of the sleeping bag, sunlight floods your eyes. It's a beautiful morning, but the woods are still full of zombies, you think. And Kim is out there by herself, where you left her. You've got to go back for her. When you reach the clearing, there's no sign of her. But you notice something that you missed last night. Find it on page 111. Half hidden behind a bush is a wooden sign. You brush the leaves out of the way and read, Camp Ahead. You're back at Camp Running Leaf? You didn't like... You didn't much like the camp, but you can't wait to get back now. You follow the sign up to a small hill and then gaze down. In the valley below is a huge camp. A big sign in front says, Welcome to Camp Pendleton. Camp Pendleton? Have you made a mistake? No, you realize. Camp Pendleton was the camp you were supposed to attend in the first place. It was the camp Uncle Ed promised to take you to. Going to Camp Running Leaf was a mistake. A big mistake. You rush down the hill to Camp Pendleton. Forget about Running Leaf, the outdoors medal, Kim, and the zombies. You hope you're just not too late for breakfast. The end. Five endings! You're just going to go back to your, your fancy rich boy camp? I don't know, you guys. I don't want this fancy rich boy camp. Okay, so our next option back is the point where we had the option of climbing up the mountain towards a mountain lion or climbing back down towards a zombie. And we decided that a zombie was easier than a mountain lion. But this time we're going to say, hey, we're going to take on that mountain lion, which is probably completely terrifying, um, but we're going to do it anyway. You'd much rather face a mountain lion than a walking corpse, you think. You glance at the mountain lion again. It kind of reminds you of your cat, Smokey, back home. We can handle the cat, you tell Kim confidently. You pace towards the beast. Here, kitty kitty, you croon. Kim stays a couple steps behind you. The mountain lion's yellow eyes don't blink. It crouches there, tail twitching. You're starting to wonder if this is such a good idea. The beast still reminds you of Smokey when she's getting ready to kill a mouse. You gulp. Maybe you should back up. Too late. Before you've gone three steps, the big cat springs. What happens next? Well, We'd really rather not go into details, but we'd be lying if we said it wasn't the end. Oh, lion, L-I-O-N. More puns, you guys. I love puns. Six endings. Okay. 
So next step back is uh, when we first set off, we had the option to climb the mountain, which is a very steep trail, but shorter, or we can follow the river around, which is longer and has some unknown obstacles, but is less treacherous. So this time we're gonna follow the river on page 16. We'll follow the river, you declare. You and Kim set out along the bank. The river flows swiftly next to you. Zombie Mountain stands tall above you. It would be a perfect hike, you think, if it weren't for Kim. My feet hurt, she complains. She punches you in the shoulder. This was your dumb idea. The path starts getting muddy. I'm ruining my new sneakers, Kim whines tough you reply what a baby you think the path grows muddier and gunkier and kin's complaints grow louder and more obnoxious she starts blaming you for the slow going please you think let us get to zombie cave soon your thoughts are cut off by kim's terrified scream quick turn to page 83 A snake, Kim cries. You look. It's just a garter snake, you grumble. Chill. A few minutes later, Kim screams again. What now? Across the river, she shrieks. A zombie. You roll your eyes. There's no such thing as zombies, you mutter. Will you hurry? The other teams are going to beat us to zombie cave. You slog down the trail. Kim sulks behind you, and then she screams again. The zombie! It's back! Look! Oh, please, you grumble. You peer across the river. Hey, what's that moving over there? Something tall and pale flickers behind the trees. See? Kim hisses in your ear. It's probably another hiker, you say. But suddenly, you're not so sure. You know zombies don't exist. But you wish Coast Crump wouldn't have talked about him so much. You look again. Whatever it was, it's not there anymore. Just another hiker, you tell yourself. Relax. Oh no, Kim cries. Now we're really in trouble. Find out the trouble on page 46. What's the matter now, you ask? It's nearly sunset, Kim whines. And we're nowhere near Zombie Cave. It's your fault. You picked the wrong route. You realize you might not make it to the campsite by midnight. You've got to move faster. You gaze at the river, wondering what to do. And then you spot something that might solve your problem. Just ahead, a small green rowboat is hauled up on the bank. A sign on the boat says, Private Property. If we row... We'll reach the other side of the mountain in no time, you tell Kim. That boat doesn't belong to us, she objects. If we get in trouble, it'll be your fault. Fine, you snap. You'd almost rather go to jail than listen to Kim whine for one more minute. Besides, Kim asks, the map says there are rapids ahead. Rapids? That could be a real problem. What are you going to do? If you guys want to decide to take the boat anyway, you can choose option one. Or if you'd rather try to continue on foot, you can choose option two. Get ready to vote, non-responsive peeps. Maybe we'll have music. There we go. 43 seconds to vote. Nobody has told me how impressed they are with all the trees in my house right now. I cut all these off the shrubberies outside my house today and then stuck them back here. And they're not super wilted yet, which is real great. So. Ooh, who's Yuperlative? Who is that? Who are you? You didn't vote right, but I love you. Who are you? Oh, 
Oh, it's Maya! Hi, Maya. Welcome. That's not the song it's supposed to play. Sorry, you guys. We're still in Jeopardy. I got distracted talking to Maya. Okay. So, we decided that option two is our best option. And we're gonna continue on. I lost my tabby. We're gonna continue on foot instead of uh, taking the boat. On page seventy-two. That boat doesn't look sturdy enough for the rapids. You think? Besides, you really don't want to steal it. You get in trouble. So you and Kim stick to the muddy trail. A few minutes later, you spot another trail leading away from the riverbank. This way, you exclaim, the trail leads straight towards the mountain. Instead of swamp and mud, you're walking on grass. I told you we should go this way, Kim cries. She pushes ahead of you. Liar, you think. You don't really care. Because at the end of the trail, you've spotted a dark hole. It must be Zombie Cave. Hurry, you urge Kim. We're almost there. Kim speeds up. You speed up behind her. The trail is covered with soft moss and grass. Kim takes another step and disappears. Kim, you yell. You rush up to where you last saw her. You step on the soft, mossy surface, and your foot goes right through. You're falling. Fall onto page 75. You fall about 10 feet and then thud down beside Kim at the bottom of a pit. Ow, you groan, climbing to your feet. Where are we? Kim's voice shakes with terror. How should I know, you snap. You peer up at the opening of the pit. Too deep for you to climb out, but a dark tunnel yawns in front of you. You have no choice. You have to walk through it. You step cautiously forward. The air is thick and damp, and you wonder if you're having a nightmare. If so, you can't wait to wake up. The deeper you go, the darker the tunnel gets. It's so stuffy in here, complains Kim. I can't breathe. She can't breathe? Hmm. Not a bad thing. Maybe that means she'll shut up, you think, hopefully. A moment later, you step into a large cavern full of flasks and beakers. It looks like some sort of science lab. Dim light fills the room, but you can't tell where it's coming from. At the far end, a cage hangs from the ceiling. You step closer. What's in there? When you see, you clip a hand over your mouth and keep screaming. Go on to page 127. On first sight, the cage seems filled with humans. On second sight, it seems filled with ex-humans. They're dressed in rags and partially decomposed, as if they were corpses, except they're somehow alive, like zombies. The creatures moan hideously. One of them shakes the bars of the cage with its rotten hands. It clacks its teeth at you. Foo! It cries in a groaning voice. Foo! Foo! What? What's that? Is the zombie trying to speak? Kim jumps behind you, trying to use you as a shield. Zombies! She shrieks. Let's get out of here! Now! For once... You agree with her. Your knees tremble with fear. Turning, you stumble back towards the dark tunnel. But then a tall, bulky figure steps out and blocks your way. Turn to page 59. You stop short. Who are you? You gasp. I'm the cemetery man, the tall figure informs you. The cemetery man? The one Coach Krupp said didn't exist? Uh-oh. You can't see his face in the darkness, but his deep, hoarse voice is somehow familiar. Thanks for falling into my trap, he says, chuckling. S trap? You stammer. Yes, I set it up for my zombies, the cemetery man rasps. You see, they love the taste of human flesh, especially brains. They believe eating brains will make them smarter. Imagine... An army of intelligent zombies. You can't let them eat her brains, you cry. 
Can't I? The cemetery man aims a remote control at the zombie's cage. He presses a button and the door swings open. The zombies lurch towards you. Foo for what? They moan. Foo for what? As zombies surround you and Kim, you finally figure out what they're saying. Food for thought. Food for thought. The end. Oh. You got it. You figured it out. You're the winner for today. Oh. Are we playing Mad Gab now? You guys. That's kind of fun. <laughs> okay. Let's see what our next pathway is. We're going back to where we can take the boat, but it's sketchy as heck. So we're going to do it on page nine. We're taking a boat. As a side note, I'm pretty sure I know every word to the Lonely Islands, I'm on a boat. And uh, maybe I'll record my own separate music video in this outfit after we're done streaming. We'll see how I feel. You'd rather risk the rapids than keep walking, especially since it's getting so late. Anyway, you think, you're not stealing the boat, you're simply borrowing it. You and Kim climb in. The current carries you down scene so swiftly, you don't even bother to row. We should reach Zombie Cave in a few minutes, you exclaim. All this rocking is making me sick, Kim, Kim whines. She does look a little green. This was a dumb idea. She could be right, you think, worried. The current is getting faster, and now you're starting to see big rocks in the ri river. The river forms white up ahead. Hold on, you shout to Kim. Crack! A big rock knocks Kim's oar out of her hand. Crack! Your oar breaks in two. The roar of the river grows louder. Off to your left, you spot a small stream. But that's not where the noise comes from. It comes from that tall spray of white water rising into the air dead ahead. The waterfall. Better think fast. If you guys want to jump overboard, choose option one. If you want to try and steer towards a small stream, choose option two. Thanks for saying I look so cool today. I feel like this is just my new look now. Now that I realized I can go full uh, emo scene kid with my haircut. I'm just gonna do that all the time now, maybe. We have 20 seconds left to vote, you guys. Choose option one, to jump overboard before the rapids, or choose option two, to try and steer the boat towards a small stream with no oars, because we broke both the oars. Okay, polls resulted in a tie. Guys, why was it a tie? Okay, I guess I'm going to try and jump overboard and see what happens on page 76. Oh, you want to twins with me? Yes, I want to twins 100% of the time. So, um, I got this hat at Walmart yesterday, so you can get the same hat too for $5, so do it. Um, can you swim to shore? It seems to be your only chance. Jump, you shout to Kim. The boat is only a few feet away from the falls. The rushing water sounds like thunder. You jump and choke as a huge wave slaps you in the face. Swirling water grabs you and pulls you down, down, down to the bottom of the river. It tumbles you around and around like laundry in a washing machine. And it's pushing you towards the falls. Your lungs are bursting. In another moment, they will fill with water. 
Your body is scraped and bruised from the rocks. Why did you think you'd swim away from a waterfall? Newsflash, you're all washed up. The end. Oh, no. Oh, no. I don't know where we're at. I have to scroll back up. We had six, seven endings. This is seven. It is seven. Seven endings. Wow. I do, although the last few weeks have been pretty fun, I do kind of like um, having the endings more spread through the whole book this week than we've had previously. We just went forever with one story and then it was like end, 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 end. But now we're kind of, we're kind of zooming around and that's okay. I like that. Okay. So we're going to go back and I guess we're not going to jump overboard because I guess we can't swim out of a waterfall or whatever. So uh, we're going to try and steer towards a small stream on page 60, which I'm pretty sure both of our oars broke, so I don't know how we're going to do that, but let's give it a shot. Your only hope is to row towards the streamlet on your left, but the current is so powerful. Will you make it? Only one way to find out. You hand one oar to Kim. Row, you shout to her. Row on the right side of the boat. You dip your oar into the water on the right, too. Together, you and Kim row as hard as you can. The boat begins to inch left towards the little stream. Up ahead, the falls rage. Closer, closer. You glance at the white water and gulp. If you go over, you'll be smashed into a million pieces. Harder, you shout to Kim. Row harder. You dig your oar into the water. Now the falls are only a couple feet away. You're going to make it to the little river stream? Or are you going to over the edge? You can't watch. You shut your eyes. Turn to page 129. Suddenly, the sound of the waterfall gets more distant. You open your eyes. The boat bobs in a quiet inlet. Excellent! You made it to the little stream. I wonder where we are, you say, gazing around. I'm too seasick to read the map, Kim moans. She hands it to you. You glance at the map. Even you can figure this out. A trail from the shore goes a little ways up the mountainside. It dead ends in a cliff. But you can see the dark hole in the cliff from where you are. There's Zombie Cave, you exclaim. Come on. Climbing over the side of the rowboat, you wide ashore. The water doesn't even come up to your knees. Kim, of course, doesn't climb out. Not until you've dragged the boat up onto the bank so she doesn't have to get her feet wet. You two, the two of you start up the trail to the cave. You're almost there when a terrifying moan stops you. You peer up the slope in the fading sunlight. Yikes! A monster is staring down at you. Go on to page 134. I'm like, man, if she was just in rapids in that boat, like, there's no way her feet are not already wet. I'm just saying. Yeah, Kim is totally annoying. The creature stands directly in front of you. It's the size of an adult man, but it's missing an arm. Its other arm and legs are covered with sores and scabs. Its face is a thing from your nightmares. Half the skin is rotted off its skull. One eye is missing. Two black teeth dangle from its gums. Kim screams. It's a zombie! You gasp and start backing down the path. Foo! The creature cries. It staggers after you. You whirl and begin to run. Go! You scream to Kim. Run back to the boat! It's nearly dark. It's hard to see where you're going. You slip and slide on the rocky trail. At last, you see the boat. But there's another zombie on the path in front of it. You skid to a stop just before you run into the hideous thing. You spin, looking for an escape route. Too late. You and Kim are completely surrounded. Surrounded by hideous, undead creatures. Turn to page 21, if you dare. You decide to take the right-hand fork. 
You take a gulp of water and then start towards the right. The trees are thick on this trail. The farther you go, the harder it is to move. Branches and twigs scrape your face and arms. You stop to catch your breath and you hear something behind you. Something large. Wait, we already had this one. Did I go to the wrong page, or is that actually what happened? You guys, I forgot where we were. Are you sure I said 121? I lost track. Um, it might be a time loop. I just, I'm not sure where we came from. Um, it just, it was kind of a weird transition, you guys. I'm so sorry. So I feel like maybe we came from somewhere else, but I'm not sure where we just came from. Mm, give me a minute. I'm just going to turn the Jeopardy music on while I look. sorry that I my act is not together for you I thought it was and now I'm just like don't even know I thought we were at the end and then I don't even know where we came from I don't see anything going to that page I'm so confused I got rid of our bookmark, so I lost it. Okay, that wasn't the right way. I have no idea. We're completely lost. I'm so sorry.
Oh, small stream on page 60. That's where we took. Okay. I found it. I found it. Let's see. 60 and then 129. Okay. There's a monster staring down at us on page 134. We're surrounded by hideous undead creatures. Did we do that? I feel like we should have. I'm so confused. Oh my gosh. Okay, so okay, so I'm gonna apologize, and um, it's almost nine o'clock, so I'm gonna say we're gonna just go ahead and take our intermission here. I'm gonna flip through this book and try and figure out where the heck we are and what was going on, and uh, yeah, and then we'll be back in a minute. <laughs>
Okay, I'm back. And so I feel like I figured out where we were and somewhere we just took like a real wrong turn and that was where the problem started. So, um, where we were at was taking the boat and I remember being like there's a creature standing in front of you the size of an adult man but it's missing an arm its other arm and legs are covered in sores and scabs and its face is a thing of your nightmares half the skin is rotted off its skull one eye is missing two black teeth dangle from its gums Kim screams it's a zombie and you start backing down the path Foo, the creature cries it staggers after you you whirl and begin to run go you scream to Kim Run back to the boat. It's nearly dark. It's hard to see where you're going. You slip and slide on the rocky trail. At least you see the boat. But there's another zombie on the path in front of it. You skid to a stop just before you run into the hideous thing. You spin, looking for an escape route. Too late. You and Kim are completely surrounded. Surrounded by hideous, undead creatures. Turn to page 21 if you dare. And then I feel like here... Maybe I just went to some other page instead of 21. So here's 21. Foo, the zombie groans. Ugh. What do they want? Kim asks, trembling, whisper. I think they want to eat us, you whisper back. The zombie circles you. Their putrid flesh smells like a combination of rotten eggs and car exhaust, only stronger. Ugh, they moan. Foo! Ugh! The one-armed zombie reaches towards you. A worm slithers over its oozing, rotten palm. No, you scream. You swat his arm away. Slump. The arm falls right off his shoulder. It hits the ground with a sound like a wet sponge. Ugh! He bellows. The other zombies press closer. And now, they sound angry, too. Great move. Now you're really in trouble. You think fast. You have no weapons. And besides, what could you kill a thing that's already dead? Wait, you have that survival kit. The one Crump gave you at the start of the hike? You have no idea what it contains. There might be something in there that could help you. Or you might waste precious time checking it out. If you guys want to see what's in the survival kit... Then you'll choose option one. If you want to just try and fight your way out, you'll choose option two. And those options will become available in mere seconds once the poll loads. And we can add that to our experience right now on Twitch. So go. Option one, check what's in the survival kit. Option two, fight your way out. That was a lot of real fast votes, you guys. I have literally no idea how we ended up on the wrong page previously. And whatever it was, it like lined up well enough that we didn't notice. So that's interesting. Everclear? I don't have any more. There were just two baby shots in it. That was all there was. So, I don't know. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So, almost everybody chose option one. We're going to see what's in the survival kit on page 92. Oh, I'm totally hardcore. Yeah. That was a lot of numbers there. You reach to your pack and grab the survival kit. You open it with shaking fingers. Your heart falls right down to your toes. All the kit contains is a bar of soap and a sewing kit. Wait a second. A sewing kit? Maybe that's the answer. Check out the plan on page 117.
quickly you thread the needle. You snatch up the zombie's arm from the ground. What are you doing? Kim shrieks. Just watch, you say tensely. You hold the arm out. Hey, zombie, you call as calmly as you can. The armless zombie gazes at you suspiciously. You stick the needle into the arm, and then you pull the thread all the way through. Ugh! Kim exclaims. You press the arm against the zombie's shoulder, and then you push the needle in. It moves easily through the soft, rotten flesh. You swallow hard as you try not to hurl. A few quick stitches, and the arm is attached again. The zombie stares at you, and then it opens its mouth in a big, drooling smile. Woo! it crows. The other zombies crowd around, touching the stitches. Roog, they murmur. Their voices sound excited. Your plan worked. The zombies are no longer angry. But now you have another problem. Face it on page six. Several zombies form a line in front of you. The tall one at the front stands shakily on one leg. It holds its other legs in its hands. Roog, it moans, thrusting its leg at you. It wants you to sew the leg back on. Kim whispers. Rrrg, a third zombie moans. This zombie is carrying one hand and one foot. It holds them out to you. Some zombies are worse off than others. The most newly dead are in good shape, but the old ones are really falling apart, and they want you to put them back together. You hand Kim a needle and thread. Help me, you order. For the next hour, the two of you sew rotting arms, legs, hands, and feet back onto their owners. The stench is incredible. Your hands are covered with worms and bits of oozing flesh. I can't take this anymore, Kin moans. Shut up and sew, you command. Finally, you're done. Every zombie who needed repairs has gotten them. You stand back and admire your work. Then, the worst thing in the world happens. Just what is the worst thing in the world? If you really want to know, you can find out on page 73. Pleased and happy, a zombie claps her newly mended hand on another shoulder. The mended hand falls off. Oops, you're not as good a tailor as you thought. One by one, all the other body parts that you sewed on start falling off. The zombies slowly turn towards you. Kim is trembling. We've got to get out of here. No way, you assure her. I'm sure it'll be okay. We just have to sew them up again. Yeah, sure. Later, Kim mutters and bolts away. You hold up the needle and grin weakly at the approaching zombies. Satisfaction guaranteed, you offer. With a swipe, one zombie knocks the needle from your hand. This does not look good. Desperately, you begin. I could try a different stitch. But the zombies don't let you finish your sentence. They surround you, and then they begin to tear you apart limb by limb. Uh Uh-oh. Your life is hanging by a thread. Snip. The end. Oh. That's another ending that I don't know the number of. Eight? I think it's eight. Yeah, eight endings. Okay. So we'll go back and fight our way out instead of checking the survival sewing kit on page 85. Come on, you say to Kim. Let's fight our way out. You take a swing at the nearest zombie. Squelch. Your fist goes into its stomach, up to the elbow. Big, big yuck. The zombie falls back with a hideous moan. You feel like puking, but you don't have the time now. You and Kim dash up the trail leading to the zombie cave. You glance over your shoulder. The zombies stalk after you. They move slowly, but steadily, and they look hungrier than ever. 
Head for the cave, Kim shouts. We'll be safe in there. It's a place called Zombie Cave, you reply. I doubt it. But peering around, you realize you have no choice. The cliff in front of you looks too sheer to climb. The trail to the cave is steep and rocky. Very rocky. One especially big boulder balances on a ledge by the cave mouth. Hmm. That gives you an idea. More on page 77. You and Kim dash up the mouth of the cave. The pack of hungry zombies is closing in on you. We're trapped, Kim screams. Not yet, you pant. You put your back against the big boulder and begin to shove as hard as you can. What are you doing, Kim demands. Hold me, you cry. We can start an avalanche. It will never work, Kim declares. Don't you know anything? Zombies are the living dead. You can't hurt them. Maybe not, you mutter. But we can slow him down. You push harder on the rock. It starts to totter. And then it topples. When the boulder hits the ground, part of the cliff collapses. A ton of rocks pour down the trail. Urgh, the zombies moan as they're pelted with stones. Arms and legs fly in every direction. Heads roll. The zombies haven't been destroyed. But it will be a long time before they can pull themselves together. When the rocks stop falling, you step up to the opening of Zombie Cave. A faint light glows from inside. Go to page 126. Carefully, you and Kim poke your heads into Zombie Cave. Hello, you call, hoping no one will answer. Phew, no one does. The cave is empty. You peer down at the floor. No footprints in the loose soil. You must be the first hikers to reach the cave. Come on, Kim says impatiently. Let's find the bones. Where is the light coming from, you wonder? And then you notice the faint green streaks of glowing minerals on the cave walls. A quick search doesn't turn up any bones. First, you feel disappointed. And then you feel something on your leg. It tickles. Absently, you reach down and scratch your thigh. Ugh! A giant spider crawls onto your hand. With a yell, you flick the spider away. It flies off your hand and lands on a glittering object half buried in the cave floor. A gold ring. Maybe we should dig here, you suggest eagerly. We might find buried treasure. Or maybe find buried terror. See what's next on page 71. Okay, so I noticed it was a time loop, but I wasn't quite sure if it was a time loop on the part that we did accidentally or the part that we did for real. And now I'm like pretty sure it's the part that we did for real. So we're at eight endings in one time loop. Okay. So our next step back goes back to when we first hit the map and we were choosing if we were going um, east or west of the Mississippi. And we initially chose east of the Mississippi, so we're going to try west of the Mississippi on page 61 and see what happens that way. You turn left at the fork. That will take you back to the main trail, you hope. Kim, you call? Kim, are you there? No answer. The trail begins to climb. Soon, you're at the top of a steep cliff. You glance down at the sharp rocks below. You step cautiously onto the narrow trail along the cliff. You edge around the big rock and continue slowly hugging the cliff. Then, you hear a crunching sound. There's someone behind you. It must be Kim, you think. You stop and wait for her to appear. But then you gasp. Whoever is coming isn't Kim. It's not even human. You watch in horror as the thing begins to come around the bend. All you can see are two long, sharp horns. What is it? Take a peek on page 67. You start to scream, and then the rest of the creature appears. You laugh in relief. It's only a mountain goat. Bah, it cries as it trots up and nuzzles your hand. Bah, yourself, you tell it, laughing. I don't have time to play with a goat. 
You turn around and continue along the steep trail. You glance back. The goat is following. Bah, it bleats. Go away, you order. You hike on. The trail narrows even more. You're so busy keeping your balance, you forget about the goat. Until it butts you in the back. And it knocks you right over the edge of the cliff. As you plunge towards the distant rocks below, you realize the sad truth. You're a lousy hiker after all. No ifs, ands, or buts. The end. <laughs> okay, that was nine endings. One time loop. Get it? No buts? Because it head butted you off the cliff, I guess. That's sad that you were just like killed by a goat trying to love on you, but whatever. Okay, so now we're back to our second choice of the whole... You didn't get it? You met up with a mountain goat and the mountain goat head butted you off the cliff because it didn't like you, so sorry. Um, we're back to our second choice of the book where they told us to partner up and uh, we had the option to pair up with Kim or to hike alone and we did choose to hike alone so this time we're gonna try and hike with Kim and see what happens on page 118. You sigh. All right let's team up you say to Kim. You watch while she studies her map. You hate to admit it but it's true. Kim is a much better map reader than you. Zombie Cave is on the other side of the mountain, she remarks, pointing to a squiggle on the map. Also, the campsite's on the same side of the mountain as the cave. Dun dun dun. That was a time loop. We already looped to, her, to meeting up with her. So that's nine endings and two time loops. So now we're back to the first choice in the whole book. Um, so apparently we finished that entire run of picking the hike and instead we have to pick the selection on page 125. No. We didn't, we didn't do that. We did take the rib, yes. Yeah, that was a thing we did at some point. Okay, 125. I'll do the selection, you tell Coach Rex. Coach Rex smiles. Good. Maybe you'll go far after all. And I mean far. He starts chuckling, as if he made some big joke. You laugh politely. Now, the coach gets serious. The selection is tough. If you're going to win, he says, you need strength, and that means a big breakfast. Come on down to the chow hall. The coach takes you to the big cafeteria where the other kids are eating breakfast. Everyone stares at you when you walk in. Then they go back to their breakfasts. Each kid has a big pile of eggs. They quietly scarf down their food. No one's talking much. You notice a mountain bike in a glass case on the wall. It's top of the line, and it's brand new. Sunlight gleams on its blue carbon fiber frame. That must be the special prize for winning the selection, you think. Cool. Now I really want to win. Go on to page 40. You get your pile of eggs, topped by toast. As you search for an empty seat, you see someone that you know from home. Hey, Pat, you exclaim. You sit down next to a thin, fast-talking kid. He lives a few blocks from you. You're glad to see a familiar face. Hi, Pat answers. I just got here a couple days ago. Most of the kids have already been here a few weeks. He hasn't touched his eggs, he tells you. I'm not hungry. You notice that he looks kind of sick. He's pale, and his eyes have dark circles under him. Well, I'm starved, you announce. You plunge your fork into the eggs and lift it up to your mouth and then your hand suddenly freezes whoa the egg yolks are blue turn to page 10 
Your mouth snaps shut. What's with the blue eggs, you demand? Just then, a voice comes over the loudspeaker. It's Coach Rex. Eat up, campers. The selection is coming, and your eggs are packed with the protein you need. You ask Pat, are you going to eat your eggs? He shakes his head. No way. He picks up a piece of toast and nibbles on it. You eye your eggs. You don't normally eat blue food. Except blue M&Ms, of course. Who doesn't eat blue M&Ms? But you don't want to act differently from everyone else, especially on your first day. Blue eggs? Should you eat them or get rid of them? Or use them to start a food fight? So we're going to have three options here, you guys. Choose option one if you want to eat the eggs. Choose option two if you want to hide them in your napkins. Or choose option three if you want to throw them across the table at the kid next to you. And maybe we'll have sound here in a second. Cool. I did it. We got it, you guys. Will they become zombies if they eat the eggs? I'm going to guess that they're not gonna be zombies from eating the eggs, but they probably don't have like full cognitive ability. two votes you guys is that right I'm starting the poll over you guys didn't vote there were two people that voted did I just not track it right Option one, eat the eggs. Option two, hide them in our napkins. Or option three, throw them at the kid across from us. I expect more than five votes. There's 13 viewers right now. Let's get some more votes going. More votes, more votes. 17 seconds left. Option one, eat the eggs. Option two, hide them in the napkins. Option three, throw them at the kid across from us. Seven seconds left. Okay. Much better. Obviously, we chose option three because who wouldn't want to start a food fight? Honestly. That's like my favorite thing as an adult is uh, starting a food fight. You do have to be responsible enough to clear it up afterwards, but it's totally worth it. We're going to go to page 39. Food fight! You bellow. You stand up and fling a handful of blue eggs at the kid across the table. They splat all over his face. Pat flips his toast like a frisbee at another kid. You both laugh. Without warning, a big hand grabs you by the collar. Uh-oh. It's Coach Rex. Veins bulge in his forehead. Come with me, he growls. Coach Rex takes you from the cafeteria to his office. So you're messing with the eggs, he snarls, throwing around vital nourishment. No, you gasp. I was just having fun. You blink. You can almost see steam coming from Coach Rex's ears. Let me show you something, he says. I think you'll find it very interesting. What could be more interesting than blue eggs? Turn to page 15 to find out. Coach Rex points to a large ant farm on his desk. Pasted on it is a handwritten label. It says, Camp Farm. Coach Rex lovingly pats his ant farm and waves at his little occupants. 
See the ants doing their job? He barks at you. They don't talk back, and they don't have food fights. You nod your head numbly. This camp is like an ant farm, and the campers are like ants. Do I make myself clear? You think, Earth to Coach Rex, kids aren't ants. But out loud you say, Crystal clear, Coach Rex. I'm sorry, but you are not selection material, Coach Rex declared. But we'll see how you do as a team player. Oh, man, it's only your first day at Camp Running Leaf, and you've already been axed from the selection. What a bummer. You leave Coach Rex gazing at his ant farm and slink back to the cafeteria. Get going on page 51. As you slide back into your seat at the cafeteria, you notice Pat's lips are covered with blue egg. I thought you weren't going to eat your eggs, you say. Pat shrugs. One of the coaches made me. They're pretty good. He smiles weakly. His eyes look a little glazed. Another camper, Charlie, comes over. He's about your height, but he's very muscular. Come to think of it, all the campers look strong. But hey, this is a sports camp. In a monotone, Charlie says, I loved food fights at school, but... He scratches his head, as if trying to remember something. We must eat our eggs, not throw them. Another camper shuffles over. Yeah, he chimes in. We're supposed to follow the rules. You roll your eyes. What's wrong with these kids? Haven't they ever heard of having a little fun? You're beginning to think that this place is like an ant farm. Everyone acts like they're in an army. You're not sure you can hack this place. Maybe you should pretend to be sick and call Uncle Ed to pick you up. On the other hand, what if Uncle Ed thinks you're a wimp? Maybe you should just stick it out. If you want to pretend to be sick and call Uncle Ed, then choose option one. If you want to try and stick it out, choose option two. So 15 seconds left to vote. Option one, pretend to be sick and call your uncle. Or option two, try and stick it out and not call your uncle. Okay, we chose option two. We're going to try and stick it out on page 58. So, you ask Pat, pretending everything is normal. What's the first sport of the day? Baseball, he answers in a dull voice. Pat was always a little dull, you think. But now he's really drippy. You follow him out to the baseball diamond. You coach, the coach chooses up sides. You play shortstop. You ask the players to take it up to the infield. No one does. You ask them to talk it up in the dugout silence. Everyone is hitting the ball and playing well, but is anyone out here having fun? Finally, you're a bat. You pop a weak one up to the second baseman. The next batter drones. Coach told me to hit a homer. Must hit a homer. Whoa! She knocks the first pitch right over the fence. Now you really want to do well. Next time around, the batter before you singles. The coach tells you to lay down a sacrifice blunt, but you get the fast pitch. Should you follow orders, or would you rather swing for the fences? You're going to choose option A if you want to swing your hardest, or choose option A if you bunt. I only kind of know a little bit about baseball, so I guess like that, that's a thing, but I don't know why you'd want to do the one over the other, but vote anyway. Choose option one to swing our hardest for a home run 
Or choose option two to bunt the ball for whatever purpose that does, because I don't actually know uh, what purpose everybody's choosing to, and I don't, I don't know what the purpose of that is, but I guess if you're choosing two, that's what we're gonna do. <laughs> Someone tell me what that does! I'm not hilarious. I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about sports. I thought I knew about baseball, but clearly I do not. Um, and we've already, we got seven seconds left in the vote. I didn't even play it anywhere. So we don't listen to coach. They'll know we didn't eat our eggs. That's true. But everyone else still voted for two. So we're going to go for the bunt. I don't remember if that's what he told you to do or not. Page 27. That's where we're going. Go, sports! <laughs> you want to move that runner to second. So you drop down a good sacrifice bunt. Way to go, cheers the coach. You smile. And then you hear him say, You must be eating your eggs. Be sure to eat them three times a day. What's the story, you wonder? Why are the coaches pushing eggs on every camper? Over the loudspeaker, the bugle sounds. Like clockwork, all the kids drop their balls and gloves and march to the cafeteria. They move like robots, you think. The lunch menu, blue omelet sandwiches. This time, you hide yours in your napkin. Pat gobbles his down. Whoa. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. I don't know what that's supposed to sound like. Everyone jumps up and runs out back to the fields. Sorry for my terrible bugle impression. Come on, calls Pat. You must be late for an activity. You stare at Pat, puzzled. When did he turn into such a stickler for rules? One minute, he's normal, then... Wait. Didn't he change after eating the eggs? Turn to page 98. Enough worrying about Pat. You decide to check out the soccer game. When you reach the field, one of the goalies is holding a hand over his swollen purple nose. It looks broken to you. Go to the nurse, Antoine, his teammate tells him. You can't play anymore. I don't want to leave my goal area, Antoine cries in a plugged up voice. And I'm not going to go to the nurse. No one comes back from the infirmary. Your eyes widen. Is Antoine serious? A tall girl grabs you. You can play goalie, can't you? What should you do? Should you replace Antoine as the goalie? Or you could volunteer to play for forward instead. If you agree to play goalie, choose option one. If you'd rather play forward, choose option two. So, as good as sports as I am, I do know what a goalie is versus a forward because they did force me to play team sports in middle school. So I know that the forward, I think that the forward can move over both sides of the field. I'm pretty sure he's the one person that can do that. But I'm only like 90% sure that that's what's happening. We've got three votes in. We have 20 seconds left to vote. Option one, to play goalie to replace Antoine, or option two, if you'd rather play forward and turn to page 53. Um, so in addition to soccer, I think the same rules follow for hockey, and I know more about hockey than I do about soccer, and so I think it's the same. Okay, um, everybody voted for option one, so... We are going to play goalie and replace Antoine on page 20. I'll guard the goal for a while, you tell Antoine. Antoine glares at you and then stalks away. The soccer game starts again. The powerful players kick rockets. You hope your defense keeps the ball away from you, but they don't. A kid from the other team breaks free and takes a shot. Boom! No way you're going to try and stop that. You dive out of the way of the speeding ball. 
it tears the net in half. The soccer coach, Goodrich, comes running over. Your job is to stop the ball, even if it kills you. Death by soccer kick, you laugh? No way. You glance around. Whoa. No one else is laughing. Okay, you promise. I'll stop the next shot. But you don't stop the next one. Or the one after that. Some of the shots whiz by so fast you never even see them. Finally, Coach Goodwitz tosses you out of the game and calls back Antoine. You slink back to your bunk. So maybe you're not quite ready for the World Cup. Dribble to page 91. The bugle sounds for dinner, but you ignore it. You have a pretty good idea what they're serving. Instead, you lie in your bunk thinking, why are the eggs blue? And what's so important that the campers eat them? Pat returns from dinner. You missed a great eggs Benedict, he drones. You should eat them like everyone else. Your stomach growls. I wasn't hungry, you lie. A few other campers straggle into the cabin. You introduce yourself. They barely look at you. To break the ice, you say, Coach Rex acts like this is boot camp, not a sports camp. A kid named Preston stares at you. Don't put down our master, Coach. He should be respected and obeyed. Pat adds, Don't make waves. Just get with the program. Man, they sound like robots. The bugle sounds again. This time, it's playing taps. Lights go out all over camp. No one laughs or tells stories. You feel very alone in this creepy camp. Go on to page 42. You lie on the bunk, thinking about your first day at camp. At first, you only hear your bankmates snoring. And then you hear a voice. A voice you know well. Coach Rex. He's talking to another coach as they make the rounds of the cabins. And what they're saying makes your blood run cold. This is a pretty good crop of specimens, Rex is saying. Is the transporter ready? asks the other. As soon as we fix the wormhole lens unit, Coach Rex answers. Specimens? Transporter? Wormhole lens unit? What are they talking about? Find out more on page 88. You strain your ears to hear more. I heard one of the specimens gave you some trouble this morning, the other coach says. Started a food fight. Yeah, Coach Rex growls. Kid wouldn't eat the eggs. But the rest are chowing down on him three times a day, getting stronger and more obedient. They better be, or the masters on Xenotron will rearrange our organs. Ouch, Coach Rex exclaims. I hate when that happens. Are you dreaming this? You pinch yourself. Yow! That hurt. You start to panic, because this definitely is no dream. Turn to page 68. You still really don't know what coaches are talking about. You, you only know that something bad, really bad. You've got to get away. But you can't just leave yet. Rex and the other coach are still chatting outside. You close your eyes and wait for your chance. Will it ever come? Well, that depends on what you did today. If you played goalie, turn to page 99. If you played forward, turn to page 105. We chose goalie, so we're going with page 99. It's a good thing you played goalie and saved your energy, because now you're able to stay awake. Rex and the other coach finally move on. You quietly dress and creep out of the cabin. Your plan is to find a phone and call Uncle Ed for help. But after a few minutes of searching, you realize the truth. There are no phones at Camp Running Leaf. Well, it makes sense in a horrifying way. They don't want anyone to contact the outside world. Then... In the distance, you hear Coach Rex's voice in the loudspeaker. Alert! Alert! Escaped camper! You listen more closely. Now you hear what sounds like a hundred people marching together. Tromp! 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 The marching feet are coming your way. 
Oh, no. If they catch you, you're in major trouble. Go on to page 19. Desperately, you try to think of a way out. That's when you remember the old man down the road. The one that gave you directions to the camp. He might let you use his phone. The trouble is, it's the middle of the night. Can you convince him to let you in? You snap your fingers as you remember something else. The old man said there was a gas station near the camp. A gas station would probably have a payphone, and you could call Uncle Ed from there. You dash up the driveway leading out of the camp, out onto the main road. Now you have to decide. Should I go right to the service station or to the left to the old man's house? Choose option one if you want to try and get help from the old man and turn left. Or choose option two if you want to try to go to the service station and turn right. We still have 16 seconds left. You can vote option one to get help from the old man or vote option two to go to the service station. Okay. We chose option two. We're going to go to the service station. So, that's page 24. You cut right on the road, making for the service station. In the distance, you hear the sounds of the camper searching for you. You hear Coach Rex screaming, Find that traitor! Oh no, if Coach Rex gets a hold of you, You'll end up in the infirmary, the place of no return. Thank goodness, there's a gas station, and there's a payphone. You search your pockets for a quarter. You can't find one. That's okay. You can call collect. Uncle Ed answers the phone groggily. What? He mumbles. When you relate the story, he sounds disbelieving. I mean it, Uncle Ed, you insist. Camp Running Leaf. <laughs> You should call it Camp Run for your life. All right, all right, I'll come get you, Uncle Ed promises. Just wait in front of the gates of the gas station. As soon as you hang up the phone, you hide in the back of the gas station. The searchers are coming closer. Peeking around the corner, you see them, an army of glassy-eyed kids. Hurry, Uncle Ed, you whisper. Hurry. Turn to page 89. You doze off. The sound of a, cor a car honking wakes you. Cautiously, you peer around the corner of the gas station. Uncle Ed, you cry when you recognize this car. You run to the station wagon. You yank open the passenger door, only to find that it's already occupied. By Coach Rex. The coach grabs your wrist. No more escapes for you, he snarls as he loads you into the back seat. Uncle Ed, what's happening, you plead. I took you to Camp Running Leaf instead of Camp Pendleton on purpose, he says. Our alien masters pay me well to direct kids here. It's a recruiting station for Xenotronian mind slaves. But, but you're my own uncle, you wail. Uncle Ed shrugs. Sorry about that. Just business, nothing personal. Now, where can I drop you off, Rex? The infirmary, Rex commands. From there, this camper is going on a long trip. Right, Uncle Ed chuckles and turns to you. Well, kid, soon you'll be shoveling Klaatu crystals on Xenotronian mine. I hope you dig the experience. The end. Oh, man. Oh, 
Okay, we're going back. Have we moved on to the pear drink things? No, I still am trying to finish this drink with the last of the Everclear in it before I moved on to the pear drink things. Have you not had these? Because these are great. I love them. Um, anything from Blake Cider Company is spectacular, and that's my thing. Um, give me one second. So, what is it? Do they make the rainbow one? The rainbow what? Oh, um, Blake's? Yes, um, Blake's does make, they make the, um, the rainbow one is, uh, it's, oh, it's so good. Why am I? my mind is forgetting it um i drink that one a lot rainbow seeker it's like basil pineapple or something it's really good um i really love that and yeah so blake's is just super awesome so congratulations on joining an alien mine you guys um we are going to head back and see what else we can find in this book um, I guess the service station was not the right choice, so we will try to get help from the old guy we talked to before on page 84. Somewhere in here. You turn left and race down the road. You keep running and running. Your legs burn and your lungs feel as if they're about to burst. Where is the old man's house? Was it some kind of mirage? Suddenly, a black shape looms out in the darkness. There it is, the old man's house. No lights are on. You approach the front door slowly. Raising your fist, you knock. The door swings open. You peer into the dimly lit hall to see who answered it. There's no one there. You gulp. Should you go into this creepy place? And then you hear a faint trump, trump of many feet. The campers, they're on your trail. Looks as if you've run out of choices. Check out the old man's house on page 44. You slip inside and shut the door. Slowly, silently, you creep through the dark hall. Ee, ee, ee! A weird, high, pulsing sound drifts through an open door. You peek around the edge of the doorway. Steps, going down. To a cellar, probably. Your heart thuds as you pad down the steps. There's another door at the bottom. The pulsing sound is coming from behind it. You slowly open the door. What you see makes your eyes bug out. The room inside looks like NASA mission control. People in headphones stride back and forth from radar screens to electronic maps. We've got an interstellar camp running leaf link up, someone is yelling. Wow, you gasp aloud. Big mistake. Find out why on page 104. A huge hand grabs you. Who are you? Barks the huge guy attached to the huge hand. Uh, I'm from Camp Running Leaf, you re reply meekly. A woman comes up. I'm Agent Alice Draper. We're with the government. We've been monitoring transmissions from planet eight light years from Earth. The transmissions have been tranced to Camp Running Leaf. She raises an eyebrow at you. What can you tell us about this camp, kid? You repeat what you heard Coach Rex say about Xenotron. Draper's eyes light up. This is amazing. The camp must hold incredibly advanced technology. Good job, camper. The next few days are a blur. The government sweeps in helicopter and raids the camp. Coach Rex and the rest of the staff are arrested for kidnapping, conducting business with an alien government without license, and worst of all, not paying their taxes. The arrests so anger the Xenotronians, they invade Earth. Way to go. You're responsible for the total destruction of the human race. Oops. The end. <laughs> Oh, I don't know how many endings this was. Is this 10? 
I don't even remember, but that was like kind of a good ending, I guess. Then we just destroyed the whole earth because we were like ratted out the camp, I guess. Oh, I'm trying to go back and find it for sure. It's gonna take a while. We have a little while between the uh... I can't do it. I have no idea. Who knows? Someone was keeping track, not me, right? Is this is this 10? I don't know. I can't scroll far enough back to find out. Please tell me someone was keeping track. I have no idea what number ending we're on. I think it's 10, but I'm definitely not positive. Um... Nine? I don't know. I don't know. I can't scroll back far enough in the chat to find out. Because someone needs to decide. <laughs> I did it last week, not it. Yeah, that's fine, Luda. It's fine. I just can't keep, like, a notebook and a regular book and all my stuff straight everywhere. So someone else, I just need, I need help doing that. No one else did it. So... I have no idea. We're going to pretend it's... Right, exactly. I can't I can't scroll back. I'm going to say it's 10. Because I... F uh, should we say it's 9? No, we have to count them. It's important to count them. Uh, let's say it's 9. Let's say this is 9. I feel like it was like 8 and 2. I feel like that was like the last one. Two timeless and nine endings. Before or now? Does this include, is nine including this one? Two timeless and nine endings including this one. I feel like that's what we're going to go with. Okay. Two time loops, nine endings. Going back. Um, okay, so the next option is like if we go back, if we played forward... But we didn't actually do that yet, so I feel like we need to go further back to, like, the hop, the soccer game in order to choose that and then eventually end up in that other spot. So, um, yeah, so we're going to go back one more step, and instead of playing goalie, we're going to play forward on page 53. I'll play forward instead. You volunteer. The goalie can keep his job if he really wants it. The rest of the team agrees. You jog onto the field. Sweet! The soccer coach, Goodrich, blows a whistle. And the game starts again. Soon, you're wishing you'd agreed to 10 goal. It might have been a little easier. You were the star player on your soccer team at home. But these kids have legs of iron. They don't play like humans. They play like maniacs. When the coach tells them to execute, nothing stops them. You can't knock them off the ball. And their bullet shots pass and bullet shots and passes force you to duck. This is the first time you've ever been scared in a soccer game. By the time it's over, you're completely bushed. You drag yourself back to your cabin and collapse onto your bunk. Turn to page 91. The bugle sounds for dinner. You ignore it. You have a pretty good idea of what they're serving. Instead, you lie in your bunk thinking, why are the eggs blue? So that's a time loop to 42. And then 88. And then 68. And then 68 is where we chose to be the forward instead. So we've got nine endings and three time loops now. Um, we're going to go to page 105 because we played forward. You sure did a lot of running around when you played forward. Now you're exhausted. Try as you might, you can't keep your eyes open. Coach Rex's voice becomes a gentle buzz. You dream that Pat is forcing blue eggs down your throat. You struggle, choking, but you can't stop him. The sound of the loudspeaker blaring revelry joints you awake. It's morning. Automatically, you get out of bed. That's when you glance down at the t-shirt you slept in. 
It's smeared with blue eggs. Pat is standing in the doorway with a wicked grin. You're one of us now. You feel different, mellow, obedient. You wish only to do as you're told. And later, when the blue-skinned Xenotronian overlords tell you to dig the Clado crystals, you ask only one question. How deep, sir? The end. Okay. Eleven endings. Three time loops. We'll go back. Okay, the last option was to, um, when we were playing baseball, we had the option to swing our hardest or to go for the bunt, and we all followed the bunt like we were told, but this time we're going to swing our hardest instead because we think we can get it on page 136. The fastball is too tempting. You lace it to the left for a single. You stand on first base, grinning. But the first base coach grabs you and throws you out of the game. You were told to make a sacrifice bunt, he fumes. You disobeyed an order. As he pushes you off the field, the other players shake their heads. Obey the rules, the first baseman calls in a dull voice. Follow orders, your pal Pat sneers. Respect authority, another kid chimes in. Aren't you guys taking the game a little too seriously, you ask? The coach turns to the others and says, What do we do to those who aren't team players? The campers chant in one voice, Sacrifice! Sacrifice! All the players stalk towards you with their bats raised. That's when you realize the horrible truth. They're not talking about a sacrifice bunt. You got to first base. Too bad you'll never make it home. The end. Woo! that was a good one they sacrifice your butt okay 12 endings and three time loops and I can't type okay so there's only two tabs left but there's got to be like a lot more options because all these say there's at least 20 endings so there's probably a lot more still gonna happen you guys okay so in this last page um we decided to stick it out instead of pretending to be sick and we're gonna pretend to be sick instead on page 79 and see what happens Okay, you say we haven't hit the long timeline yet, and I feel like we're just bouncing around it this time. Where, like, in the last couple times, we just, like, happen to follow the exact right path to make it all the way through. You hold your stomach, groaning. Oh, I'm sick. Where's the infirmary? Charlie points to a low, white building across the cafeteria. Hope you make it back. Huh? Why wouldn't you make it back? At the infirmary door, a voice behind you makes you really groan. Got a problem, camper? Coach Rex asks. I had a bad stomach ache, you reply, doubled over. Coach Rex shakes his head in disgust. I knew you wouldn't cut it. He pushes you through the door to the infirmary, locking it behind you. Nurse, have you repaired the transporter yet, he demands. Transporter? Turn to page 33. The nurse, a bone-thin woman with a knobbly bun, shrugs. I've done the repairs, but I'm still not certain how well the transporter's working. Well, let's use this one as a guinea pig, Goch Rex suggests, pointing at you. All right, just step this way, dear, the nurse coos. She steers you onto a large steel platform. This won't hurt at all. Your head whips back and forth between Coach Rex and the nurse. What are you going to do to me, you stammer. Coach Rex tells you, if you make it to Xenotron, there's no reason you can't work in the mines. I'm sure you'll last as long as the average slave, three years. What's Xenotron? What mines, you demand, terrified. Then, from above, a blue light sweeps over your body. 
You feel a tingling. Whoa. Coach Rex, the nurse, the infirmary, they're all fading from sight. You're really being transported, just like in the movies. Unfortunately, the transporter isn't working right. Instead of sending you to Xenotron, it beams you directly into the sun. In seconds, you're so hot, Coach Rex could fry a blue egg on your head. But hey, it could be worse. At least you'll get a tan this summer. The end. Oh. Oh, man. What was that? Okay, 13 endings. Three time loops. We're going to do another um, two minute uh, intermission. BRB, for real. Maybe. It's real life, though. Okay. Okay, surprise. Okay, we're back. Thank you for the sor short, um, temporary break there. Um, yeah, so I guess they just transported us to the sun instead, and then we burned up, which is not cool. Okay, so we're going back. Back. Um, we only have one tab, and again, we're still not... It says 20 endings. It says 20 endings, and we have not gotten there, so... Um, okay, so we have two different options now. So we're back to the part where we're eating breakfast. And we um, previously chose to start a food fight, but the options were actually to eat the eggs or hide them in our napkin. So we're going to go ahead with a new poll for the eggs where we 
don't get to start a food fight. So it's obviously the lamest option because we all know we want to start a food fight. It's the best thing. It's my favorite thing. It's your favorite thing. Um, I'm just stalling for the pull at this point to load. But we're going to choose option one if you want to go ahead and eat the eggs or choose option two if you want to hide them in your napkin. And yes. Option one, eat the eggs. Option two, hide them in your napkin. We have 20 seconds left still to vote, you guys. We only have four votes in. Choose option one to eat the weird blue eggs or choose option two to hide them in our napkin and pretend we ate them anyway. Okay, more people voted for option two. We are going to hide them in our napkin on page 94 and see what happens. You check to make sure no one was looking. Then you casually put the napkin on top of your eggs and fold them inside and slip it under the table. A second later, you hear a voice behind you. I saw that. You freeze. It's Coach Rex. Rex points at another camper and barks. You spit out your eggs. Don't let it happen again. The camper, a tough looking kid with a black buzz cut, nods. You let out a sigh of relief as Rex walks away. He didn't see you hide the eggs. Who's the guy who didn't eat the eggs? You ask Pat. His name's Brad, Pat answers. Do 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 do. A bugle blows revelry outside. The campers rise as one and march out the door in neat files. No one talks, no horseplay. You know what I call Camp Running Leaf? Pat whispers to you. Camp run for your life. He grinned at his joke. Pat doesn't smile back. Go on to page 106. I hope you guys can hear all the fireworks outside because those just exist 24 hours a day in my neighborhood. So I hope you enjoy that along with me. Outside. Coach Rex announces, fun time is over. He stares at the campers. You've eaten your eggs. You should be ready. The selection is about to begin. And remember, the winner gets a very special prize. Rex checks his watch. All athletes who think they're worthy of it report to the stadium right now. You're not going to do it, are you? Pat whispers. Of course I am, you reply. You practically drool, thinking of the new mountain bike gleaming in the cafeteria. Coach Rex claps his hands. Let's go. You join the eerily silent stream of campers heading for the stadium. The other campers may be stronger, but you want that bike more than they do. The coaches are waiting for you at one end of the field. Listen up, people, Coach Rex bellows. The selection runs like this. The athlete with the most points at the end gets a special prize. For the first event... You can choose between hurdles and swimming. What are you good at? Do you want to jump hurdles or would you rather go swimming? Choose option one if you choose hurdles or choose option two if you choose swimming. We still have 18 seconds left to vote. Option one, to try the hurdles, or option two, to try swimming.
Okay, we had more people choose swimming. So we're going to go to page 63. Let's swim, you suggest a pat. I hate swimming, Pat complains. I'm going to do hurdles. Okay, you shrug. Good luck. Privately, you're a little relieved to see Pat go. He seems so gloomy, and you're ready for some fun and some sports. The swimming coach, Carla, orders the swimmers to follow her. As you head to the water, a voice behind you calls out, Hey, loser, get out of my way. You turn around. It's that Brad kid, the other one who didn't eat the eggs. He struts past you. The gold is mine, he sneers. The rest of you are just fighting for the silver. Brad is one obnoxious dude. You don't much like him, but he's got spirit, unlike the other campers. You think, neither of us ate any blue eggs. Is there a connection? Brad's nose wrinkles as you get closer to the water. What's that smell, he demands. Yuck, I smell like a giant dump of rotten eggs. What could be causing it? Find out on 120. The smell comes from the lake you're about to swim in. Coach Carla announces, swimmers, line up. The 400 meter swamp swim will begin in 30 seconds. The longer you wait, the hungrier the alligators get. Alligators, your heart thumps. Brad looks worried too, but none of the other campers seem trouble. They just do what they're told. They must know Coach Carla is a kidder, you think. You gaze down at the murky brown water. Bubbles come up from under the surface. Big bubbles. Swimmers, on your mark. For a moment, you think about skipping this event. And then you remember the gleaming new mountain bike. You bend your knees and thrust your arms back. Get set. Bang. Dive in on 124. You hit the water hard. And then you take a few strokes underwater. You come up gasping for air. The water is thick with mud and vegetation. It feels as though you've landed in a bowl of pudding. You swim hard, trying to block out the putrid smell. Sputtering and gasping for air, you lift your head. Brad is ahead. You plow on, trying to catch him. And then you hear a cry. You see a pair of arms grasping for help above the water. And then... They disappear under the water. Oh no, one of the other kids is in trouble. What are you gonna do? Dive into the muck to save the kid that went underwater? Or should you get help from Coach Carla? If you guys wanna dive down, choose option one. If you wanna swim back to Coach Carla for help, choose option two. still have 20 seconds left to vote choose option one to swim back to help him or choose option two to swim forward to coach Carla to have her help him we got five votes no more votes friends Okay, I was going to use the, um, I don't know, a quote from some sort of ancient Greece thing, but I didn't remember it, so just pretend I did that. Okay, so we're continuing on to page 37. Take a deep breath, because you're about to dive into a stinky muck. You double up and head for the bottom. At first, you can't see anything. The muddy water hurts your eyes, but when you get a few feet below the surface, the water clears. There's no sign of the kid who went down. You look all around. Nothing. But wait, there's something lying at the bottom of the lake. Something white. You swim in for a closer look. 
teeth grin up at you. Whoa, it's a skull. A human skull. Swim to page 116. You swim closer. You're terrified, but you have to get a closer look at the skull. A crowbar lays next to it, and there's something square and white a couple feet away. It looks like an ID card or something. You've got to go up for air. Grabbing the white square, you bring it to the surface. It's a plastic ID card. You just make out the words U.S. government through the mask. This is serious. The ID badge of a government agent at the bottom of a lake and next to a human skull? How did the skull and the badge get there? Why is there a crowbar next to them? You have to go back for another look. You suck in a big breath and dive to the bottom. As you approach the skull, you notice something odd. Two small yellow lights moving towards you. You swim to the skull. The lights are still coming. Two black dots appear in the center of the yellow lights. Your blood suddenly grows cold. Those aren't lights. They're eyes. Get a closer look on page 55. The yellow eyes are coming towards you. Fast. They're just a few feet away. That's when you see a long green snout. A snout that opens to reveal dozens of long, jagged teeth. An alligator. Think fast. What are you going to do? Do you have time to do a frog kick and get away? Or should you grab the crowbar, crowbar and try to defend yourself? Whatever you do, you better do it now. If you want to do a frog kick and try and get away, choose option one. If you want to use the crowbar to defend yourself, choose option two. So we chose option two. We are going to grab the crowbar and defend ourselves with the crowbar on page 108. You grab the crowbar. The alligator's mouth gapes wide to chomp on you. You thrust the crowbar inside the chompers. The crowbar wedges the huge alligator jaws open. That gives you a chance to swim away. You pop to the surface and swim as hard as you can. You're the last one to the finish line. As you lie gasping on the shore, Brad gloats. Did you swim here or take a rowboat? By the way, I came in first. There was an alligator, you gasp. You can hardly talk. Your teeth are clattering from fright. Your comment catches Coach Carla's ear. Alligator? Did you say you fought off an alligator? Yes, it is right over there, you scream. Turn to page 22. The alligator is sitting on a rock in the middle of the lake, trying to get the crowbar out of its mouth. So what, Brad smirks. You still lost the race. Coach Carl appears at the alligator. You expect her to call an alligator catcher immediately, or at least look shocked. But instead, she does some calculations on her clipboard. And then she raises your arm in the air. You get bonus points for the alligator. This means you tied with Brad for first. Your mouth falls open. Is she kidding? Coach Rex claps you on the shoulder. Good work fighting that alligator. You finally find your voice. Good work? You sputter. How can you let kids swim in a gator-invested swamp? Coach Rex's smile fades. 
He gives you a chilling glare. Just get ready for the next event. You and Brad walk into the stadium. Dozens of campers watch silently from the stands. Coach Rex strides right behind you. You hear him tell one of the other coaches, Watch these two. I have a feeling they didn't get their eggs. You shiver. Now you want to win the bike more than ever so you can escape from this horrible camp. Turn to page seven. Even Brad seems shaken by Coach Rex's words. He mutters to you, did you eat the eggs? No, you answer. I hate eggs, Brad says. So I gave mine to my friends. And then they all started acting weird, like they couldn't think for themselves. It's the same thing you noticed. You can't believe what you're thinking, but could the eggs be controlling their minds, you whisper? Oh, get real, Brad scoffs, but his voice shakes a little. You shrug. All I know is, I want to get out of here, and fast. This camp is scary. Listen up, Coach Rex barks. You and Brad jump. The next event is the high bar. The coach goes on. After that, the javelin. And then the two athletes with the highest point totals will go on to the final event. The gymnastic coach points at you. Get ready for your routine, he orders. You bend down and dust your hands with rosin. But when you straighten up and glance at the bar, you can't believe your eyes. Flames are shooting up from the ground under the high bar. Go on to page 62. Already, you can feel the heat from the flames. Beside you, Brad makes a gulping noise. He stares at the flames with round eyes. That's it. This camp is some kind of weird death trap. Pat was right. It should be called Camp Run for Your Life. Brad, you muttered, we've got to do something. Maybe we can just run out of the stadium, he whispers. No way. Coach Rex is watching us like a hawk, you point out. Brad snaps his fingers. I've got it. We can both fake an injury during our routines. I'm not sure. You gnaw your lower lip. We might be able to escape later. First gymnast, the gymnastic coach yells. Your choice, Brad whimpers. Now, camper, Coach Rex bellows. Time's up. Make your decision. If you fake an injury during your routine, you're going to choose option one. If you go for the gusto and wait for a better chance to escape, you're going to choose option two. But we're all going to stall until this pole loads. And we're just going to keep stalling here for a second. I'm just going to keep waving this book. And don't vote yet because we have to wait to vote. And then eventually it will load. And now choose option one to fake an injury during your routine. Or choose option two to go for the gusto and fake it later on. Okay, well, it was a tie. So it looks like I'm gonna go with option one, we fake an injury. If we fake an injury during our routine, turn to page 74. Let's fake injuries, you whisper quickly to Brad. You take a deep breath and run toward the bar. The flames are turned up as you jump for the bar. They roar from underground gas jets. Heat sears your feet right through your sneakers. You start to swing around the bar. Flames lick at you. Now you know how a barbecued chicken must feel. You do a couple of practice twists. You're actually a good gymnast. It's hard for you to pretend to do badly when you know you could be top dog. 
but you've got to escape from camp. Run for your life. Okay, now's the time. Your plan is to let go of the bar. When you land, you'll pretend that you hurt your ankle. You swing around one more time. Then you release your grip. You're sailing through the air. Whoops, you flew a little too far. Right into the ring of fire that surrounds the landing mat. Bad news. Really bad news. You're not top dog. You're a hot dog. The end. Oh my gosh. So I have no idea how to run any of this. That's like 11 endings. I haven't been paying attention because I've been coming is. here. Check out my outfit, y'all. Okay. We're like See, I like scroll up to where I'm at. Because I'm not keeping track. Where did I comment? This is why it's hard. I have to. Yeah, someone should be controlling. Someone, I can see why it's help with this. helpful it's if someone else keeps track yeah. of the things. I have no idea. Transported didn't work right. 13. 14, 14 endings. We're at 14 3. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marina. Um, I, I feel like I will hand this over now because I have crazy <laughs> performance anxiety and she just like, okay, you're on. Um, and I did okay, but I'm shaking. You did great. You did great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we died, you guys. 14-3. We're going to go back. I'm still there on mine. You're still there. Oh. Uh, she said, Ashley's your favorite. And I have your cup. It's clean. It's in the cabinet. It's safe. Don't worry. It's not forgotten. Okay. So instead of faking an injury this time, uh, we're going to go for the gusto. And um, for a better chance to escape, wait till page 122 and follow whatever they want, I guess. I don't know. Wait for a better chance, you quickly tell Brad. You square your shoulders, and then you run towards the bar. Flames lick at your feet as you swing up, but you ignore them and concentrate on your routine. Good thing you took gymnastics last summer at your other camp. You're good at this stuff. Every flip and sw spin could land you in the fire, but you've never worked the bar so well, even though your shorts are starting to smell scorched. Uh-oh. The hot bar is starting to blister your palms. You better finish your routine now. Otherwise, you just, you won't just get a low mark. You'll get third degree burns. You swing into your dismount and glance at the mat. Tells you th that you have to make the perfect landing. One step in the wrong direction and you'll be in the fire. Can you do it? Can you stick your landing? Turn to page 65. Whew! You stuck your landing. The judges all hold up your scores. 9.9, 9.9. 9.9. Yes! You start to feel as if maybe camp running leaf isn't so bad. Maybe the events are just creative. Maybe you didn't really see the skull at the bottom of the lake. Maybe you should just forget about escaping. You know, maybe you should just really go for that special prize. See how Brad does on page 26. Unfortunately... Brad is also a star gymnast, a hot shot. Without even breaking a sweat, he pulls a 9.92. You're still tied for first place. You expect the audience of campers to send up a big cheer, but they're all still moving silently to the exits. The stadium loudspeaker blares a message. All campers not in the selection report to the infirmary immediately. Why are they all going to the infirmary, you ask one of the coaches. Just a routine check for a... Poison ivy, she answers. All at once? You're confused? How can such a small building hold so many people, you demand? No time for chit-chat, Coach Rex Bartz, striding up to you. Now, next up is the javelin. You fall into the javelin pit, but what you see makes you feel like forfeiting. Get to the point on page 8. A dozen coaches stand in a circle. They're holding javelins, and they're pointing them at contestants. What are these guys doing at the javelin throw, you ask? Javelin throw? Coach Rest asks in a harsh laugh. This is a javelin catch. Uh-oh. The sharp javelins come raining down, 
dozens of gleaming metal points whiz towards you. One of them is zooming straight for your head. With a quick move, you barely sidestep the javelin. Its sharp point thunks into the ground inches from your foot. If you don't catch one, Coach Rex Bellows, you lose. More of the deadly spears shoot down. You dance back and forth, ducking them. You can do this, you tell yourself. You've seen superheroes do it in the movies. Piece of cake, right? Turn to page 70. A javelin hurdles at your chest. You fling yourself to one side and then snap your hand out. Yes, you snag the wooden shaft. So does Brad. Five other contestants also catch javelins, but not with their hands. You've heard of the agony of defeat, but this is ridiculous. You want out, you think. You don't care about winning anymore. The losers are carried off to the infirmary, just like all the other campers. You glance up at the stands. There are less than a dozen people left, and they're all waiting in the long line for the infirmary. Ready for the final event, Coach Rex calls cheerily. As you turn back to him, your gaze is caught by a long pole leaning against the stadium wall, the kind they use in pole vaulting. It looks long enough to clear the wall. This could be your last chance to escape. But you've never pole vaulted before. Can you make it over the wall? Or should you hang in there? Try to win the final event and ride your mountain bike prize to safety. If you want to try the pole vault, choose option one. If you want to go to the final event, choose option two. Oh, I thought something was touching my foot and it was just a cat. <laughs> seconds left to vote if you haven't yet vote one for pole vault two for the final event and we are done almost everybody voted for vote for option one we want to try the pole vault we're going to turn to page 30 and see what happens i did do a pole vault in like middle school and elementary school so i feel like maybe i have the advantage here because i have actually done it before i don't know uh, we've got to try the pole vault, you decide. You might not get another chance to escape. Casually, you start towards the water fountain. It happens to be right next to the vaulting pole. I'm just getting a drink, you call the coach Rex. You jog up to the fountain. When you're sure no one's looking, you seize the long pole. You back up a few yards, balancing a pole in your hands. And then you start to run towards the stadium wall. Hey, coach Rex bellows. Where are you going? Somebody stop that kid. But he's too late. You've already planted your pole in the soft ground by the wall. You leap into the air. Up you soar, clutching the pole. Up, up. The stadium wall rushes towards you. Will you clear it? Or will you splat against it like a runny blue egg? Get your results on page 38. The sides of your sneakers brush against the stadium wall as you sail over it. You made it. You escaped from Camp Run for your life. You hit the ground running and you don't slow down until you're miles away, deep into the woods where no one can find you. You'd like to call Uncle Ed, but you don't have any quarters in your gym shorts. So you're forced to walk. Luckily, you remember that your friend Colleen just moved to a town only a few miles away from camp. You're pretty sure you can find it. You reach Colleen's house the next morning, hungry and exhausted. Colleen's parents have already gone to work. She's home alone. And boy, is she surprised to see you. Want some scrambled eggs, she offers. You shudder. You'll never eat eggs again. So what happened to you, Colleen demands, as you devour peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in her kitchen. 
I thought you were going to some great sports camp. Didn't you like it? You swallow a bite of sandwich and wash it down with milk. Let me put it this way, you say. Next summer, I'm going to computer camp. The end. Uh, okay, I do kind of totally dig the, the computer camp reference, though. I feel like it was pretty fun. I'm a big nerd fan, if you aren't aware. You're honored. Did you go to computer camp? Is that why you're honored? No, but it's the full vault. It was a good ending. Okay, let's see what else is in this ending. Um... Okay, so if we skip the pole vault and go to whatever the final event is, we're going to go to page 119 and try that. Coach Rex leads you to the track. The last event is called Steeplechase, he announces. You've seen that event on TV. It's the one where you run 3,000 meters around the track. But there are obstacles, like high hurdles and pools of water. You can push off of the top of heavy hurdles to vault over the water. The event looks harmless. No flames, no one throwing spears at you. And then Coach Rex smiles. Whoever survives the race deserves a prize, he declares. The word survive makes you gulp. You glance up nervously at the stands. There are exactly seven campers left, and they're moving towards the infirmary. Um, turn to page 57. You and Brad line up side by side. What do you think they have planned for us, you whisper. Brad shrugs. I guess we'll find out, he whispers back. Just remember, we're in this together. You help me, I'll help you. Sounds good to you. But then you notice that Brad doesn't meet your eyes. Can you trust him? The starting gun goes off, and you sprint out. As you approach the first hurdle, you're in the lead. Barely. You take off over the water jump. Up, up, up you go. As you come down, your heel slaps against the water's edge. A tiny bit of liquid splashes on your calf. Ouch, you scream in pain. That stuff burns. Don't let a little sulfuric acid slow you down, Coach Rex bellows at you. Acid? This is insane. You gaze desperately around. Any chance you could veer off the course and run to safety? Not much. The whole track is surrounded by, co by the coaches, so escape isn't likely. Just finish the race and get your prize. The next obstacle is approaching. You leap up, balance for a moment on top of the hurdle, and peer down at the pool. You wish you hadn't. Find out why on page 69. There's nothing in the pool. No water, no acid, nothing. It's a bottomless black hole. Watch out, loser, Brad yells in your ear. He balances beside you on top of the hurdle for a moment, and then he shoves off and pushes you to one side. Whoa, you shout, flailing your arms. You throw yourself off the hurdle. But you're off balance. Your leap isn't long enough. You land in, half in and half out of the pit. Your legs dangle over the empty space. Coach Rex runs up beside you along the track. That pit goes three miles deep, he informs you. And that's the whole truth. His whole truth. <laughs> you guess. Thanks for the info, coach. <laughs> Quit. Go to 128. Your fingernails dig into the track. Terror adds to your strength. If you fall, you've had it. With a mighty effort, you haul yourself out of the pit. You get to your feet. Your legs are wobbling. Coach Rex smiles. Good work. Now move it. You are always a good runner. It's time to pour it on. You increase your pace and pull even with Brad. And then you're ahead. Not being stupid, you're pretty cautious about the next hurdle. You pull up short and peer over the jump. What's on the other side? Whoa. It's a pit full of writhing, twisting, hissing snakes. You don't need a field guide to reptiles to recognize some of the most poisonous snakes in the world. Cobras, rattlers, pit vipers, coral snakes. What are you waiting for? Coach Rex shouts. Do I have to come up there and make you jump? You glance back. He's striding towards you. 
holding one of the javelins from the javelin catch. You have no choice. Taking a deep breath, you fling your body up into the air. See if you made it on page 86. You still, you sail through the air. Your legs pump frantically as you're still running on the ground. And then your feet touch the track. You made it. Terror carries you down the track faster than you've ever run before. You whip along like a greyhound. You're going to win this race. Suddenly, you hear a scream behind you. You glance over your shoulder. It's Brad. He's fallen, and he can't get up. He's lying at the edge of the snake pick. A diamondback rattler is coiled by his face, ready to strike. Help, he cries. If I move, it'll bite me. You've had enough of Brad and his tricks. Let him help himself, you think. And then you think again. Brad may be a jerk, but he's a jerk in need. Maybe you should go back and help him. If you guys want to go back and help him, we'll choose option one. If you don't want to help Brad and just keep going, choose option two. seconds left still to vote you guys choose option one to help Brad or choose option two to leave Brad behind because he's a douche so uh, the choice is yours like Captain Planet you have 14 seconds left to choose Last time we helped someone, it didn't go well. Except this time you guys still decided to help someone. So I guess we're going to help Brad and see what happens on page 41. You guys chose this. He is mean. I probably wouldn't have helped him, but this wasn't my choice. It was you guys. You race back past the snake pit and snatch the javelin out of Coach Rex's hands. You dart back to Brad's side. Hooking the point of the javelin under the rattlesnake's body, you lift the furious reptile away from Brad. You toss it back into the pit. It writhes and hisses angrily. And then you hold the javelin out to Brad. Grab hold, you command, and pull him to his feet. You're a hero. But does Brad thank you for saving him? No way. Instead, he shoves you to the ground. Eat my dust, sucker, he sneers. And then he sprints down the tracks and crosses the finish line. What a jerk! We have a winner, Coach Rex cries. He holds Brad's arms aloft. Brad is led to the victory platform. You stand on the track. Now, what are you going to do? Brad won the special prize. The mountain bike. The mountain bike that was your hope for escaping camp run for your life. Are you trapped here? If you really want to know... Go to page 43. Coach Rex's voice booms over the loudspeaker. Congratulations, camper, he tells Brad. Yeah, yeah, you think glumly. And then you hear Coach Rex's next words, and a shiver shakes your entire body. In a few minutes, you'll be transported from the infirmary to the planet Xenotron. Coach Rex announces... There, you will have the honor of being the Overmaster's slave. After you've served him for a period of time, he will serve you for dinner. Your jaw drops. So that's the special prize. Going to an alien planet as a slave and then getting eaten? The thought of this kind of thing only happens in movies. Horror movies. And then you have a terrible thought. What second prize? Uh-oh. You've got to get out of here before Catch Rex turns his attention to you. But how? Then an idea pops in your head. Turn to page 93 to find out more about your idea. Slowly, carefully, you sneak off down the track. All eyes are on Brad. No one sees you go. 
You dash to the cafeteria. All right. The mountain bikes still gleam in the ga- glass case. You break the case, wheel the bike outside, and climb on. And you're off. With everyone's attention focused on Brad, the coaches don't even realize what you've done until you're halfway across the field. You throw the bike into the highest gear and stand up to pedal. Hey, this is your best event yet. You zoom past the gatehouse at the other end of the camp. Rex and the other coaches give you chase, but they're on foot. You're on wheels. They can't catch you. You're escaping from camp run for your life. Pedal to page 81. You cycle down the dirt road until you reach the highway. You remember the old man down the road. You took a left to his house. You jump off your bike and race up to the porch. Bring, bring. You hit the doorbell again and again. Finally, the old man opens the door. He's holding a pair of headphones. You're never going to believe this, you pant. But Camp Running Leaf is sending kids to an alien planet as slaves. To your shock, The old man doesn't call the nearest mental hospital. Instead, he invites you in. I'm Agent Drinskull, he tells you. I had a government team that investigates alien activity. You stare at him. This is incredible. We've had our suspicions about the camp for some time now. One of my field agents went to check it out, the old man goes on, but she never made it back. You remember the skull you saw in the lake. Shuddering, you pull the ID card you found out and show it to Agent Driscoll. He nods sadly. Draper was a good agent, he tells you. Then he brightens. But at least now, we've got enough evidence to get a search warrant. Join the search on page 96. Agent Driscoll immediately gets on the phone to Washington. The problem is, it takes a long time to get a search warrant. By the time the authorities finally arrive at Camp Running Leaf, the grounds are deserted. The coaches, the campers, the transporters are all gone. There isn't even a scrap of a blue egg. However, Agent Driscoll doesn't lose heart. I'm certain Coach Rex and the Xenotronians will soon start up another camp for human slaves, he tells you as he drives home. Another camp run for your life. It could be anywhere in the country. It could even be the next camp you go to. The end. That was a real weird ending. Um, so, uh, the weirdness was, that was different than we usually have. Um, because it was just like out of nowhere and he's like you're done and that's fine and I don't remember where we were are you sure we're on 15? No, I have no idea. I'm not sure either so I'm trying to scroll back up just to make sure okay we were at 14.3 okay yeah so we're at we're at uh, 15 endings 3 time loops here and we're going to go back There's cats down here that I'm disrupting with my feet, and they're being disrupted by our stories, and the stories are disrupting them. It's just this whole mass disruption here. Okay, so our next option is to go back where we were facing the race, and we had the option to help Brad. And we're going to say, forget you, Brad. Brad, you're a loser, and you're mean to us, and we're not going to help you. And so we're going to page five instead. Forget Brad. You streak down the track. A glance over your shoulder shows Brad slowly crawling away from the snakes. Very slowly. By the time he gets to his feet, you've crossed the finish line. Rex grabs your arm and raises it in the air. The winner! You can't believe it. You've won. You get the special prize. You get the bike. But most of all, you get to escape. You're led to the victory stand. The coaches cheer, and you blink in the bright sunlight and follow Coach Rex. Congratulations, he bellows. You have proved yourself to be the best camper of them all. You have been selected. You beam, but your smile fades as Coach Rex goes on. As the best human specimen, you won't work in the mines like the other inferior campers. The blue eggs have made them strong enough to carry Klaatu crystals. 
The eggs have also made them obedient, so they'll be fine slaves. You, on the other hand, will serve the overmaster of Xenotron. With the honor comes much pain and eventually a gruesome death. Say what? Did you hear Coach Rex correctly? Go on to page 29. Is Coach Rex really saying what you think he's saying? That you went through this whole horrible selection just so you could become a slave to an alien overlord? And die a gruesome death? Come on, Coach Rex booms. Time to transport you. You're in a tight spot. But you don't give up easily. You've got one last chance to save yourself. If only you could get to that mountain bike. You leap off of the victory platform and race to the cafeteria. Coach Rex runs after you. There is no escape, he shouts. Unfortunately, he's right. The mountain bike is gone. Someone stole it. And that person is now pedaling furiously across the stadium grass. It's Brad. He's leaving camp. Run for your life. So are you. For an all expenses paid lifetime vacation to Xenotron. Luckily for you, a slave lifetime is mercifully short. The end. Oh. 16 endings. I'm going to try typing again. 16 endings. I didn't type that right. Three time loops. <clears throat> okay. Backing it up. We're back. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Um, I pulled out the loop, but there's probably like a side loop so I can find it. Ooh, oh, no, that wasn't it. Okay, what about this one? Here it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the options were to do the frog kick to get away from the alligator or to use the crowbar to get away from the alligator. And we decided to use the crowbar. We're going to go with the frog kick instead on page 107. We're being chased by an alligator on our way out. And uh, we're frog kicking it. You do a quick frog kick to get you to the surface and escape the alligator. The frog kick? Are you serious? Alligators love frogs, especially for lunch. Now, the big reptile really wants to eat you. You make it to the surface where you scramble atop a floating log. You hope you can escape the alligator up here. As if. The moment you turn around, you're facing a pair of wide open jaws, and the jaws are about to chomp down on you. What now? Turn to page 103. Without thinking, you grab the alligator's jaws. Snap! You shut them. It's as easy as closing a suitcase. The alligator glares at you. Creak! It forces the jaws open again. Snap! You glare back and shut them again. Creak! It opens the back up. Snap! Creak! Snap! Creak! Clop! The end. If you didn't get it, he ate you. You fought him, but he, but he ate you after a minute. So that's why it's the end here. So. You're welcome. That's a song from Moana, right? You're welcome. It's not as good as this book, though. So um, I have a bookmark on a end page, so this doesn't make any sense. And let's see what else we got to share. That was another ending. Where are we at? That was 17 endings. Three time loops. There's two that, oh no, it's the same one. Okay, so we chose to, um, 
fight the alligator instead of going to the coach for help. So we're going to go to the coach for help instead on page 11 when the alligator is attacking us in the swimming contest. You do a fast U-turn and return to shore. Coach Carla, help you cry. One of the kids went down. Carla comes to the edge of the water. We've got it all under control, she snaps. Don't worry about the other competitors. Just worry about winning the race. Now get moving. Confused, you start back through the soupy water. If they've got it under control, why are there rescue boats? And then you start thinking, what if someone pulled that kid underwater? Something alive. Something hungry. Like an alligator. Know what? That's exactly what happened. The thing is... One kid isn't nearly enough for a hungry alligator. A hungry alligator is going to look for a second helping. And you look pretty tasty. So if you're a second helping, but don't take it too hard. After all, you are always did like helping others. In fact, there's a name for a kid, kid like you. Gator aid. <laughs> the end. Yes. <laughs> That was the best pun of the book, you guys. <laughs> 18 endings. And three time loops. Okay, that was a good ending. <clears throat> okay, so this one is... We chose swimming instead of hurdles, right? So we're going to try and do the hurdles instead on page 95. Let's see what that happens. I want to do the hurdles, you tell Pat. Me too, he agrees. I hate swimming. Oh, lost the page. You follow Coach Rex to the track. You and Pat lift up the other kids. Coach Rex points a starter's pistol in the air. Runners, on your mark, you step up to the starting blocks. Get set, Coach Rex calls. You set your hands in the dirt, and then you glance up to check the hurdles. You can't believe your eyes. The first hurdle is higher than your waist. Its two legs are tipped with gleaming swords. It's the crossbar is a wicked-looking rusty saw. If you land on that, you've had it. Pat gulps. Oh, no. Bang! The runners take off. You and Pat take off, too. But the other direction. You're not about to jump over those deadly hurdles. Come back here, Coach Rex roars. You spy a small door near the edge of the stadium. Come on, you cry to Pat. Let's get out of here. Turn to page 112. You and Pat dash to the little door and slam it behind you. Something's really wrong with this camp, you pout. No kidding, Pat shoots back. The blue eggs, the brainwashed campers, the crazy events they make us do, it's all very suspicious. You peer around. You're at the mouth of a dark, tunnel-like hall. It slopes downhill. It's lined with huge pipes. I bet this is an old heating system for the camp, Pat says. If we keep going, maybe it'll connect to another building. Then let's book, you say impatiently. You move cautiously through the darkness. You pass an opening on the left and you think about exploring it, but then you notice the moldy smell sneaks, seeping out. You pass, you think. Finally, the tunnel ends at a metal door. Light comes through a small window set high in the door. On tiptoes, you and Pat peer through the window. See what you see on page 97. It's the kitchen, Pat whispers. Workers scurry in and out through the swinging doors to the far wall. Two cooks in aprons bustle back and forth among the bubbling vats and giant grills. That stuff isn't in the vat. It's blue. Just like the eggs, you point out. The blue liquid is poured over some freshly broken eggs. The cook fries them on the grill. One of the cooks stops to fan himself. He glances around, as if he's making sure no one's looking. And then he picks up a spray bottle and sprays himself. Huh? His face. It's melting. No, you realize. What you thought was his face is actually a thick layer of stage makeup. But there's nothing compared to what you see underneath. His skin is tinted blue. His eyes are golden. He has no nose. There's a small round hole on the top of his head. 
He's he's not human pet gasps. Save your gasps for 115. You can't believe it. You don't know whether the kitchen worker is a space alien or some kind of weird mutant. All you know is you're having a close encounter of the weird kind. Whoa, I'm out of here, you sputter. Pat stops you. There's nowhere to go. Let's wait until the cooks take a break, and then we'll slip out through the kitchen. I bet the swinging doors lead outside. You're about to okay this plan. But then you remember, wasn't there a turnoff in the tunnel? Shouldn't you wait until the coast is clear in the kitchen? Or should you go back to the tunnel and take the turnoff? If you want to wait to go out through the kitchen, you'll choose option one. If you want to go back down the tunnel, then you'll choose option two. And we're still going to wait. I'm just going to keep doing this while we wait. So there's something interesting on your screen happening. <laughs> because my computer is very slow. Okay. <laughs> okay, option one. Wait to go out through the kitchen, or option two, go back down the tunnel. Maybe. <laughs> I'm trying to make. Yes, I did it. I did it. Stop, no, don't do that, no, go back. Sorry, sorry. There we go. We still have 13 seconds left to vote, you guys. Vote option one, to wait to go out through the kitchen, or choose option two to go back down the tunnel. We had more votes for option one. We're going to go back through the kitchen on page 23. Right? <laughs> Bad choice. <laughs> you wait for the workers to leave the kitchen. Because of that, you see something you wish you hadn't. The blue-skinned worker places a plastic tube in the hole on the top of his head. Slowly, blue fluid begins to seep down the tube. The fluid flows out the tube and into the vat. So that's what makes the eggs blue. Alien brain fluid. Gross. <laughs> After the vat is refilled, the blue-skinned worker coils the tube and puts it in a drawer. Then, all the cooks troop out of the kitchen by the far door. Now's our chance, you exclaim. Cautiously, you open the door to the kitchen. The coast looks clear, and you make your dash. But then... Just as you reach the doors, someone barges through them going the other way. The swinging doors knock you and Pat flat on your backs. Uh-oh. Better go to page 100. What's this? A voice booms. Two athletes not competing? You groan. You know that voice. Coach Rex. Coach Rex waves some workers over. Maybe they haven't eaten enough eggs. They need a direct transfusion. Hold them down. Your arms are pinned. A moment later, the blue-skinned alien is standing over you. The plastic tube is in his head again. He places the other end in your left ear. No! You stare in helpless horror as the flu fluid begins to flow. Down the tube, into your ear. Your brain is being bathed in our special fluid. Coach Rex informs you. It will make you completely obedient. As the last shreds of your own free will leave you, you think, I guess this is what it means by brainwashing. Yeah. The end. Uh, special fluids for the brain. It's great. 19 endings! Nineteen endings. Three time loops. Okay. What else we got? There's more. There's a little bit more. Okay. 
so uh, we had the option to go out through the kitchen or to go back down the tunnel. We went the kitchen. We're going tunnel on 13. Let's go back down the tunnel, you whispered to Pat. It's too risky to go through the kitchen. There was a turn off a little way back. Let's see where it goes. I didn't like it in the tunnel, Pat whispers. I'd rather go through the kitchen. You think for a moment. Okay. Let me check out the turnoff. If I find a way out, I'll come back for you. You head down the tunnel. At the turnoff, you'll enter a drain pipe. Water sloshes around your sneakers. The air stinks. Soon, the main pipe breaks into two smaller pipes. Much smaller. You enter the right-hand pipe of your hands and knees. Suddenly, a strong rush of water knocks you down. Help, you shout. Your cry ends in a gurgle as you're sucked underwater. Your barrel on down the pipe. Where will you come out? Tumble to page 82. Swoosh! The pipe empties you into a river. You gasp and splash, trying to keep your head above water. After a few minutes, you manage to swim to the shore. You climb an embankment and scramble onto a bridge by some railroad tracks. A train whistle blows. You move off the tracks and wait. A minute later, a freight train rumbles by. The train is moving slowly. You grab onto a ladder and haul yourself onto an empty box car. You lean against the wall, dazed. The rocking of the car lulls you. Your eyes feel heavy. Your chin falls to your chest. The sound of someone clearing his throat wakes you up. When you open your eyes, oh no, a tall, stern police officer is standing over you, scowling get arrested on page 110. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> you try to explain about camp run for your life, but the cop takes you to the station house anyway. A bearded man is talking to the desk sergeant. Hey, Ruthie, the cop who answered, who arrested you calls. You've got to hear this kid's story. Go on, kid. Tell the desk sergeant. So you tell your story to the desk sergeant. You notice that the bearded man is listening closely. When you're done, the desk sergeant rolls over her eyes. This kid is nuts, she declares. Are you kidding? The guy with the beard sputters. That's the best story I've ever heard. He jumps up and approaches you. Kid, my name's Vincent Gilberg. I make movies, and I'd like to buy your story. A few moments later, the movie version of Escape from Camp Run for Your Life hits the screen. I said moments and I meant months. A few months later. It's the biggest hit in history. You become the richest kid in America. You decide to use your money to start your own camp. You even got the perfect name for it. Camp Run to the Bank. The end. Dude, that was the worst ending ever. Oh my god. There's gotta be... I, I hope there's another one. Because that ending sucked. 20 endings, three time loops. Okay. There's at least one more for sure. So that sucks. Okay. So we go back to the point where we first hit the camp and we had the choice to eat the eggs, hide the eggs, or throw the eggs. And we have not followed the eat the eggs path yet, which turns to page 64, which it could be like a quit death. I don't know. We'll find out. You bring the fork to your mouth. Your lips close around the eggs. Wait a minute. Let's review the facts. A. This is a Goosebumps book. B. Those eggs are blue. Now get serious. You should know better. Never eat blue eggs in a Goosebumps book. Okay. If this is your first Goosebumps book, it's an honest mistake. But the rest of you should be ashamed of yourselves. Spit those eggs out and go back to page 10. So that was a time loop. And we just hit 20 endings. And four time loops. And that was the end. That was all I had. We did it all. It's all done, you guys. We did everything. So, uh...
thank you, friends, for joining me. I wore these glasses the whole time. Even though I put on makeup underneath them, it's not great, but it exists. It's green. Um, I definitely look better with the glasses on, so we'll just keep those on. It's fine. It wasn't a short one. It's 11.15. This was as long as all of them are. Is the green okay? No. It could have been better. I wanted it to be, like, darker, and it wasn't, and then it wasn't doing what I wanted, so it exists, and it's green, but the glasses are cooler. Um, What's on your nose? What's on my nose? Yeah, what is it? Is it, because I put... It's white eyeliner. I actually put sunscreen on my nose, and, just and it left just, it. like, got gross. No, I didn't leave real sunscreen. I put white eyeliner with white uh, glitter eyeshadow over the top to make it look like sunscreen, because... But I did learn something today, you guys. So something I learned today while I was researching the whole like white nose uh, sunscreen thing is that there's something called Zinca and it was a product that opened in like, the, they made it in the 80s and it's called Zinca and you can still buy it and it's like colored sunscreen and they had it and they just put it on their nose and cheeks and it was like pink or green or you can get whatever colors you want and you can still get it in whatever colors you want including silver. So I kind of might buy some of that and just wear it like on because on my face because I can. I want to do like a um, Are you done? I was, yeah, yeah, come join us. Um, I was reading with sunglasses this whole time and um <laughs> don't mind the computer collapse while i was trying to adjust and then ashley showed up and now we're we're twinning um, wait it's great i love it um we're perfect this is her and hat my emo haircut is not hanging out dude i love my emo haircut i'm just gonna be emo every day now this is this us. is a wig they look so great this is not my it's hair. so good um and, uh, no, I, I read the whole book with these sunglasses on. They're just so light. But look, I got this, like, floaty cord for my sunglasses, too. That's, like, real life, you guys. I was, like, ready to have them hanging around my neck, but I didn't need to because I could actually read the book with the sunglasses on, surprisingly. Um, better than the days where I try and read something without any glasses on at all. Um, and then... Like your pins? I put a lot of pins on. Like your Power Rangers pin? That's a Power Rangers pin. It's great. Okay, but still, you guys, I also chopped down this giant, like, shrubbery outside my house and then put all of the branches in here. So these are, like, real <laughs> trees here that I put in my house to make this happen. Um, also, we have to choose what book we're going to read next week. So we still have... Um, let's see, this one, this one, this one. Okay, I think this is our list. The same list we go through every week. We've got Curse, no, Beware of the Purple Peanut Butter, and uh, Diary of a Mad Mummy, and the curse of the cave creatures and a knight in screaming armor uh the curse of the creeping coffin and a knight in werewolf woods so um of all of these there is definitely okay so the curse of the cave creatures is for sure like the lamest one so I definitely want to like include that at some point so that we can just like get it over with and then we can have more exciting ones again. Um, but there's a lot of options for you guys to vote on. So what do we got? Okay. Emo haircut. Yeah. No, I got like a, it's like I'm doing it the wrong way. No, I got like the full... I got like a real short cut, but it works real well as like a nice emo oh my cut. Gosh, I love your hair. I didn't even know. Doesn't it look I good like that? I love it. Yes. I didn't. I haven't worn oh, it. Oh, you're rocking it. I haven't worn it like this at all. I love it. It was short when we went camping. No. This is the same cut I had when we went Shut camping. Shut up. It is. Yeah. I just didn't part you should it. Wear it like this. I right? love it. Yeah. I'm gonna be emo now. Oh, cool. It's my new thing. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a scene kid now, you guys, because it's just gonna go this way. It's gonna be so good. 
so that was a great surprise that Ashley was surprised at my hair, even though we went camping and I had the same exact hair last week. I just like had it up in like pigtails because I was like, I can't deal with this in my face when it's hot out. So, um, yeah, so now it's just, this is just my hair now. It's fine. Okay. What do we got? The one with the bus and the grandma again. We're not doing it again. <laughs> we already did Secret Agent Dude, Grandma. Michael is like half paying attention, I think. We're not so. doing it again. Um, <laughs> screaming Armor. What do you got for Animal Crossing? What do you say for AC? For Animal Crossing? Oh, Christina and Marina are going to Walmart just for the air conditioning. That's oh, smart. that's smart. Yeah. I mean, they could come here. And I think also to buy an air conditioning unit. I'm like, they could get it here. Um, night, peanut butter, or werewolf. Peanut bubber. <laughs> nah. Nah. Uh, what do you guys I think? think? What do you guys think? We got some books. We got to decide so I can, like, prepare for this. Because I, I didn't prepare this week. And I just cut a bunch of trees down from my yard to, like, put in here in my house. So... Uh, that worked out okay, I guess. Um, armor. I feel like I did get two votes for the armor, right? Or was it the same? No, three, it was the same. Technically, because no. Luda also voted for that did as she? one of the three. That was the same person twice. No, me and Christina. The horrible sounding one? <laughs> Even the one I said we should do first so we can get out of the way? <laughs> the Curse of the Cave Creatures? Yes. I feel like it's so close to that, like, Snakebite Canyon, which you wanted which for so long. I'm so sorry. You wanted the Snakebite Canyon for so long, and it was, like, kind of lame. And I was barely a part of it. Yeah, you weren't even at that one. But Curse of the Cave Creatures, I feel like. Okay. Okay. People are saying Night and Screaming Armor. So we'll do Night and Screaming Armor next time. Um, this will be good. Like yeah. So, okay, so we'll read the back of the book. We won't read the inside cheater, but we'll read the outside cheater. So, the knight in screaming armor. Are you going to get in here? I wanted to show okay. people my knife. <laughs> my neck okay. knife. It was a knight to dismember. <laughs> uh, yes! <laughs> Your cousins, Kip and Abby, have come to visit you from jolly old England, and guess what they brought with them? A knife? No. No, it's a lizard. <laughs> Two huge crates, each containing a suit of armor and a curse. But it doesn't matter, because you're dying to see what's inside. If you open the crate marked Evil Knight, you will be hypnotized by the knight's sparkling medallion and will have to face an ugly sorceress. If you open the Good Knight crate, You'll discover a room full of mannequin heads that talk. Before you know it, you've lost your head. Can you pull yourself together before time runs out? The choice is yours in this scary Goosebumps adventure that's packed with over 20 super spooky endings. Ready to beware, you choose the scare. That's it. That's for us, you guys. I feel weird that I have my hat on. You can just see all my emo hair. I feel better with the hat on. Um, so, yes. Thank you, everybody, for t participating. And I love you all. And uh, I support hey, everybody. Hey, Eric. And they it. all... <laughs> <laughs> Take a new profile pic with a book. I just made a new profile pic with my emo haircut. Why do I need to take one with the book? I don't understand. So, uh, it's Why? fine. I took profile pic here. <laughs> Just go buy your million dollar house and be out of here. Bye. Like, whatever. <laughs> Thank you for loving my hair. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for supporting my stream. And we will be the next, next week with Night in Screaming Armor.